Hello, friends, and welcome to the Bikes or Death podcast. My name is Patrick, and I'm your host. This is a show that talks about bikepacking, adventuring, and the cool people who participate. And, as always, this episode is no exception. Uh, today I have Carrie State, who is the owner, founder, and chief mad scientist um, of k So, Carrie is a really interesting guy. I kind of got bits and pieces of that from following him on social media, um, but his true personality really showed itself on this episode. I think it was a ton of fun. Um, you know, Carrie is his own man. He, he even does his own introduction on the show. Um, it's quite entertaining. So I'll, I'll, I'll let you listen to that. Um, but you know, I, I really enjoyed talking to him. I loved, uh, his ability to share without hesitation or any kind of fear of backlash. Um, it's just refreshing. You know, he owns a company and he could be like guarded and, uh, careful about which words he said and not to cuss and to just cr- try to come across really polished and, and, and all that. And he just did. not he was just like, fuck it. This is me. This is what it is. And here it is. So, uh, it was quite refreshing. Honestly, it was great. Truly enjoyed it. Um, he drops like tons of nuggets of knowledge throughout the whole episode. And they're the kinds of nuggets that only come just from experience, you know, just from living life, being intentional and, uh, paying attention to what you're doing and trying to figure it out. You know, he's, he's given this a lot of time and thought you can tell. Um, the topics that we covered really crossed a lot of different spectrums. Uh, we, which is probably kind of my style. Uh, we didn't, we did talk about K light. We talked about bike packing. We talked about his lights and his products and dynamos and all that fun stuff. But we got into other stuff like social media and, uh, just being happy. Um, we talk about dealing with some hard things in life and then uh, figuring out how to put the pieces back together or just figure out who you are and who you want to be and to go forward, you know, how to just keep going. Um, so we talk about some really um, what I think are important things. I mean, he really did share a lot about himself outside of bikepacking. Um, uh, but it all ties together, you know, at the end of the day, it's Carrie, it is, it is his company. Um, and this is the man running it and, and filling in all those details about who he is and the things that drive him and the things that, um, are, he's passionate about those, those matter. You know, I think, I think that that's interesting. I love getting the whole story about who somebody is, where they come from, what they believe, um, and how does that inform the product? that they're making or how are, how is that informing, uh, the way that they run their company and so on, you know, just to give you like a teaser, uh, here's a couple of my favorite quotes. He said, I had to reassign how I felt about my failure or his failures, um, which is really interesting. Um, I'm going to let him talk about that. I'm just going to leave it there. And then another one he said is, I don't give a shit if all I have is a bag of rice, as long as I get to do something that I love that makes me happy. That's it. One note, uh, about the podcast. Um, we are talking from literally halfway or on the other side of the planet. So he's in Australia. I'm I'm in America. Uh, it was, 11.30 11.30 p.m. my time when we started and we finished at 1.30 a.m. And honestly, like I, I kind of sound tired at different points in the podcast and I can tell you I was not bored at all, but it was just late and I was just tired. So anyway, my apologies uh, for that and to Carrie, it's a very entertaining uh, conversation and I hope that that doesn't distract from it at all. And then the other thing is, you know, we Skyped and he's half a, half a world away and uh, the quality isn't as great, but uh, you know, you get it, you get Carrie, you get all of Carrie um, and it's all good. He is such a fun, uh, energetic person. Uh, he's just one of those people that'll just rub off on you immediately. Uh, you can, you can just tell he's, he comes in the room and all the eyes turn to him and the attention's on him. 
and uh, he just rolls with it, man. He he uh, he really handles himself well, and he has a lot of, like I said, a lot of really important things uh, that he talks about. When I was editing this episode, I was constantly laughing, um, which I hope is a good sign. I was thoroughly entertained, as I hope you will be. So um, I'll leave it there, and I'll let Carrie tell you the rest. But one quick note before that we get to the show. Um, I like to do all of my sales pitches for all the ways that you can support the show at the end. Um, I don't want to bore you with any details right now, but if, if you care about this kind of content, if you're really enjoying it and you're getting something out of it, uh, I would really appreciate it if you did stick around all the way to the end. Um, I, I do like a, I kind of close out the show. Sometimes I'll, I'll talk a little bit about things that happen in the show or just things going on with bikes or death. And sometimes I don't. And I just, say, Hey, here's how you support the show. And we we all go on our ways and ride our bikes. Um, I have to say that this has been a very fulfilling venture and I'm very grateful for the opportunity to be in this position and that so many people are, um, are really enjoying it and are helping to spread the word. And, uh, I'm, I'm, I love being in a position to be able to interview these people and bring that to you. It's, it's exciting. Every single time um, I'm releasing a podcast, I get giddy. You know, I know there's so many people that have great information, um, great stories, great personalities, and it is so much fun to be able to share that with y'all. So thank you again for rating it on iTunes. It really does help the show to grow and more people find it, and that is awesome. All right, that's it. Let's get to the show. <laughs> Alrighty, don't spill water on the computer. I just told myself that. Don't spill water <laughs> on the computer. Yeah, that's that's so a pro. How, what, how did you get the name Bikes or Death? What's what? How did that happen? Uh, just something I kind of came up with. Um, I was wanting to do a, a podcast and just trying to think of a name, and of course, I came up with you know twenty, thirty different names, and um, one day it just popped in my head, and I looked on Instagram, and no one had it. And I uh, went and looked at the domain and nobody had that. And I was like, holy shit. So I just oh, grabbed oh, it. Yeah. Yep. It's yep. basically like ride or die, you know? So. Yeah. I, no, definitely. Uh, I was in a bike shop yesterday and um, the guy, the owner of the bike shop, he goes, hey, hey, check this out. My mate told me to, to check this out. And it's all this podcast shit. And I said, yeah, I don't listen to shit like that. <laughs> and um, he goes, no, no, it's really good. Check out this is this fucking, and he's showing me all these chicks like that hardcore chick, Alexander chick, blah blah blah. Uh-huh. He goes, oh, he's just done her, he's just done her. And I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, <laughs> and I said, oh yeah, I think I'll just picked her up as K Light secretly. Uh, but anyway, uh-huh. um, he goes, oh yeah, it's it's bikes or death. And I went, oh what? Yeah, oh, I'm doing tomorrow night, man. Listen for me out. Yeah, yeah, I'll, sh- I'll do a shout out. <laughs> oh, that's so that funny. Was, that was pretty funny, eh? Like random bike shop. He's a dealer. He's like showing me this shit, you know, because I, you know what it's like. You try to, you don't want to read too much because it's just like, you know, people typing on their computer and shit. Um, anyway. Um, what do you mean you don't want to read too much? What do you mean? Well, what I mean is I don't want to have to, like I could get, I could look at depressing stuff all day and get depressed. Like, you know, there's yes. enough depressing stuff to look at, you know what I right, mean? Right, right. I wanted to look at all the, the the politics and the fights and this or that or who liked this and who liked that, you know. It's like, do your fucking head, in, you know. So I, I try not to look. I just go uh, blinkers on, do my own thing, and I, if I'm right, it'll come out the other side awesome, you know what I mean? So right. that's kind of, yeah, yeah. Because I, I grew up in a, an internet world, you know, and, um, yeah, you worry about your own shit, you know, and everyone's worried about everyone else's shit. Yeah. So, yeah. Anyway. No, so, yeah, int- that, yeah, I'm warmed up. I think I'm ready to go. I've said a couple of F-bombs. I'm, I'm sweet. Oh, good. Yeah, no, that was actually a great intro. Um, it's so crazy to me still that people um, 
you know, all over the world are hearing the podcast and talking about it randomly in bike shops. I mean, that is, I mean, that's blowing my mind, you know, I'm just a bike nerd that started a podcast talking about bikes. So it's pretty cool. Well, I think the unreality in the world. So the, the world's very kind of fake out there now, you know what I mean? And it's such uh every, all the content's branded and people just want to hear, like, this is for me personally, um, mm-hmm. not that I listen to a lot of podcasts, as I've kind of said, but <laughs> like people want to hear someone real, you know what I mean? They want to hear someone talk, you know, they want to hear the relationship between the two, the dynamics, you know, it's more than just a branded message that's nice yeah. and Oh, yeah, really yeah, hope. it's it's a marketing piece. It's it's uh, you know, ten guys sat in a room and figured out how to market something to fit a certain demographic, you know, a certain price range or whatever it is. Yeah, I get and it. And every well, single word, every word, it's like yeah, it's it's put there to 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 achieve something, you know. So I think the the rise of the podcast is is the opposite of that. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah, some of it's, some of it's, you know, controversial, but I mean, think, that's, that's what it's all about. That's, that's what it's all about. Seeing that. that well, dynamic. yeah, it's, it's about having the conversation. It's about actually w- human beings talking about whatever it is. You and I were interested in bike packing and lights and fun stuff that we're going to talk about, but, um, you know, whatever you're into, it needs to be a conversation. It can't just be a post or a meme or, you know, a five second piece on the, on the news, you know, it needs to be real, you know? And, uh, I found, I think you'll like this podcast (laughs) because this is, that's pretty much what it is. I have zero advertisers, no sponsors. I don't have a boss. That's dude. That's why I reached out to you because when you made that post, actually, can I read your post on Instagram? Oh, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, you said, uh, this is me. I am K-Light. I wear no shirt of social conformity. I wear no hat to hide my hairless shame. I am flesh and blood. I am free to be me. I am K-Light. And, dude, I I read that, and I was like, I reached out to you immediately. Um, You were already kind of on my radar as somebody that I thought would be fun to interview. But whenever you, you posted, I was like, man, that's something I really identify with, is like, I don't want a boss. You know, I don't want someone shaping my words, you know, like I want to be able to talk to whoever I want to talk to. I want to talk about the things that I want to talk about. I want to express my own opinions and, and I don't want to have to worry about the backlash, you know? So I think you'll like it. Essentially, uh, excuse the Australianism, but there's nobody with their hand up your ass working you like a puppet. Yeah. No, no one. Essentially. You know, they're just spokespeople for the, the the corporate puppet master, really. But anyway, ooh, we digress. <laughs> I didn't digress. You digress. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, do you have a set list of questions? How do you do it? I mean, uh, we're kind of already doing it. So I'll do an intro then. I'll do an okay. intro. Give it five seconds in your head. Okay. Hey, hey, Kerry from K-Light here. Thank you so much for having me on your podcast. I'm excited to be here tonight and I have some really good dirt to dish up for you. Ready to go. Straight up for the Bikes or Death podcast. Get in the scoop from Australia. (laughs) Now, can I ask you to just flip upside down, maybe stand on your head, then you can get a better relationship that I'm doing. Um, I'm standing on my head just to be the right way up with you. So I appreciate that. Um, that's what, what we a, do down on. Uh, let's get this straight because um, first off, I'm a high school dropout. I'm a dummy. And I think I wanted to bring that up for a couple of reasons. One, I'm still confused by the time change. And two, if we're going to talk about anything electrical, I'm going to struggle. So I just want people to expect that I'll probably ask dumb questions, but Hey, that's, you know, you can, you can still make me look good by making good answers. Well, there's the, the, the thing that I work from is there's always someone dumber than you and there's always someone smarter than you. And that's so it doesn't really matter the information that you offer or the understanding that you offer to your, your 
people that your subscribers because that understanding may be over someone's head and at the same time it may be boring to a scientist i mean right so you know i think it's i think it's okay to just be you i think that's why people listen so my art is to explain to a grandmother does that make sense and so that's I have such a good understanding that I can really interpret or explain it in many different ways. So I can really tailor make uh, the answers to be understandable to everybody. And I think that's the art of communication. I agree, man, that is so poignant. And it's something that I wanted to talk about because on your website, that's one thing I like about um, your brand or your website is you literally have cartoons to explain what is going on. You have diagrams and cartoons, and then you have, you even break it down. You're like, this is what it is very simply. If you want a light, well, you need a dynamo. If you want this to chart. Dude, you know. right. This is dude, right. That sounds, that he, when he talks, he wants to sound fully complex. So he sounds fully smart. You right. know what I mean? And then the other dude that goes, well, the whole idea is to give the message across, give that information understandably. So we're going to do it the opposite. We're going to make it as simple and as easy to follow as possible so the person can absorb it. See, because it's not my goal is not to look fancy. It's to be fancy. Ooh, holla, drop the mic. <laughs> well, all right, for people who aren't super familiar with K-Light, why don't you like give us the elevator pitch what is your business how do you explain it to people what do you do well basically i'm getting people ready for the zombie apocalypse perfect that's what i think hey like for me what i realized is we're going to go into a different world, eh? Like we're not going to stop driving our cars or other people aren't. Uh, There's more factories going online. You know, it's going to be hard to recover from what we're doing, to be honest. And shit's going to get real and shit's going to change. And you've got to take back the power, you know what I mean? Away from mechanised transport, away from uh, your food flowing billions of kilometres around the world to you, you know, I mean, <laughs> not really, but like, come on, come on. When the oil markets changed in Cuba, right, when there was the oil embargo in Cuba, right, they imported all these bikes, right, and everyone kind of got accidentally healthy and all the food was local because the trucks couldn't run to get the food there. So the food was better all the markets were localized and and people started getting more healthier it was like this weird you know obviously it was full on and hardcore i know nothing of it but the fact that they imported all these bikes from china to get around like that's going to be more and more what's happening people can't afford to eat and live we're going to have to show them how to live on a bicycle you see oh, yeah. i only got my license my car license like not long yeah. ago like mm-hmm. now it's probably been about 10 years ago but i was i must have been like my wife said like you've just got to do it because i'm sick of driving you around you idiot and i went <laughs> right yeah yeah i got it because i've ridden my bike like as transport my whole entire life and i've worked in bike shop my whole entire life and yeah. so this is just an extension of me being a bike mechanic is my lights. My lights got popular and there's no fucking batteries, man. No fucking batteries. And right. they're crazy bright. These new versions are even brighter. You don't need batteries. You can just kind of like keep riding. And it's like a, it's a revelation the first time you you kind of do it. You're like, well, I can just keep, I keep going. I don't have to worry about batteries. So, look, to recap on that question, it's a full batteryless system for lights and USB recharge so you can live on your bicycle just like you would other people do in a car. You know what I mean? Like they get in, they plug your phone in, the lights turn on. You're not mm-hmm. expected to do anything to make that happen in a car it just happens right. and i thought well why aren't why isn't a bike like that you know what i mean why can't you just get on your bike plug your phone in drop it in your little top tube bag you know flick your light on whatever you need to do and just ride away i mean why can't it be like that so that's what k is 
Kalite is buying back your independence through green energy technology. Wow. Well, that was a long elevator ride, but I really enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully you won't have too big a crash. Oh, no, no, my friend. Yeah. Should have got well, okay, since we're talking about um, the green aspect of your business, I, one thing I was uh, interested to hear a little bit more about was your 3D printer, you use recycled plastic or you, re you reuse plastic, so it's a recycled product? Well, essentially, I personally don't do it uh, in my uh, area, but the plastics I used are recycled. Um and so the idea is, like, for instance, bottles and all the sort of right type of plastic can be reused. It's a thermoplastic. Basically, you can keep remelting it, essentially. Um, it is made from oil, but I do do it locally and I don't ship it around the world and everything's done in my hometown. And we have a factory here and we pay good wages and people get to have a life and um, better life than probably the guy that owns a business, but we won't talk about that. Uh, <laughs> they get paid well. They get superannuation. You know, um, it's as grassroots of a product as I could possibly get, you know, and the right. beauty of 3D printing is I can change the as one aspect of the casings or or the accessories within an hour, another hour I'll have it printed out and be testing it. And so the evolution cycle uh, with this type of prototyping is so much quicker. And I really think you're ever, on a lot of industries, you're starting to see the changes uh, of 3D printing and especially the rise of the homemade makers. Yeah, like seriously, yeah. as soon as the 3D printers come out, I've like, fuck, off, I've got to get one of these today because I was still making stuff by hand. Like any bike dude knows that you're scratching through the bolt drawer and the fucking spare parts drawer and you're cobbling shit together to make dudes work that don't have too much money or need a fix or, you know, you're just trying to repair an old bike or whatever. Like we are the ultimate bloody bike bashers, you know what I mean? And the whole scheme of things, the bike yeah. mechanic is, yeah. you know what I mean? And so... The fact that and then I've got a 3D printer, I can actually do a good job. Like, oh, my God. Oh, my you know, God. As soon as we had the 3D printer, I was like, yeah, get one of them. Now I've got uh, four. four where, where are you based out of? Well, uh, in Australia, um, Sydney is kind of like a big capital city where we're two hours from Sydney called Newcastle. Okay. And uh, a little bit nicer up here, there's let rat, let less rat, rat race. I mean, if you could imagine Atlanta, uh, Sydney is probably like a, a mini version of Atlanta. You know, it's a bit of a nightmare to get around. Whereas up here, it's all a bit more open and you, it's got beaches and easily accessible. So Newcastle, yeah. uh, Australia, um, an old coal town that's kind of rechanging. How many, uh, how many people do you have in your company? Well, you see... There are several ways to run a company. What I've personally done is I've outsourced um, my work to a local electronic manufacturing company in, uh, here in the city. Okay. Um, and so these are uh, an electronic company that reached out to me after I was on Shark Tank. Um, so I, I did Shark Tank and they didn't really get me. I was a little bit, they called me a mad scientist. I'm not, I'm not hundred percent sure why there, but anyway, they said, oh, you're a mad scientist. Your idea is good, but you're not right for us. Thanks. Which was oh. great because really it's not my thing. Shark Tank wouldn't have worked for me. Eh? And so this local bike rider seen me and gone, oh, that dude's in town. He knew a guy that worked at this electronic place and you know like manufacturing in australia is not like smashing it. it's all in china so these yeah. guys hey give them a call knock on the door let's chat and they're really super good guys and i had the big machines to help me sort of cross over from doing it in my shed because mm -hmm. essentially not too much and i couldn't like i had two hands and that was it and i couldn't physically do it all and yeah. i just 
it was too much. It cooked me. I got too cooked. So and how so long? I, how long yeah. have you? How long have you been? When did you start K Light? And then I'm guessing what happens? You started it very. You know, it was just you, and then you went on Shark Tank at some point. And then when did that happen? I'm just trying to get a timeline. A timeline. So I was I, I bought mechanic since the nineties. Right. And then twenty four hour racing kicked in in the nineties and we all love going around and around in circles. Right. <laughs> and and just when HID was big, right? Uh, the LEDs technology is becoming of 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 good power and that started to rival that of incandescent and, and, and HID lights. Yeah. And me being the tinker, I wanted better runtime, you know, a better experience for my clients as a bike mechanic. I moved over to LEDs, and I remember this 24-hour race where this guy was going really good, and his lights crapped out, HIDs crapped out, and I had a prototype LED light on, and so we swapped it out, and it worked really sweet. And I think from then on, that event kind of put me out there. You know, I was I was a team mechanic. Uh, for some of the Australian teams and some of the, you know, national teams overseas and stuff like that. So I already had a little bit of a name for being a really good mechanic and mixed with my kind of understanding of lights, I was then like the go-to 24-hour mechanic guy. Oh, nice. And so by doing that 24-hour mechanics, by being that light guy, people knew about my lights. They were battery back then, eh? Yeah. And, um, and then I, I, I've got so many orders, I just, well, so many inquiries, I kind of had to start doing it for real. Mm. And so in 2006, I thought, shit, I've got to bloody do this for real. Otherwise, it's like I'm going to be killing myself building lights and working all day wrenching on bikes. So I kind of thought, well, I'll start co-light, you know, carry light kind of. Uh-huh. That's how okay yeah. for carry light. Um, yeah. So anyway, did you quit so, being a bike mechanic and go all I, in? I had to move town because in Wait, Canberra, where, you cut out real quick. You said you had to, to do what? Move town. Had to move city because it was just I was only going to be a bike mechanic uh, in that town. Uh, I had to go somewhere where no one knew me, and that I was forced to do something else. So in 2006, I moved up to Newcastle, started K Light Batteries, and that was awesome. Uh, well, it was really good, 24-hour pump. Uh, and then our postal company banned the shipping of lithium batteries. It was like a lithium scare. Oh. And I couldn't get my battery-operated systems around. Um, yeah, so it kind of stuffed me for wow. a light battery. But in 2006, I also made a super cool Dynamo light, eh? Yeah. When and was I- the Dynamo invented? I don't even know how long the dynamo has been around, so I'm curious what the relationship of the history of the dynamo is to the... Real brief history. Yeah. So the dynamo uh, is actually um, a DC generating device. Um, More correctly named magneto is what we have is the field coilless um, AC generating device and these date back to early cars that used to have them in um to recharge batteries etc and they've always been a form of them in cars there's been a form of them in bikes since kind of the 50s and 60s and they were quite big uh they were used to be in little bottle dynamos that would run on the side of the wheel i think we all remember those ones um and Sturmy Arch used to make some pretty cool ones back in the day. So they've always existed, but with incandescent lighting being kind of set at about 60 lumens per watt, and three-watt dynamo wasn't really going to get you a lot of power. So what happened is when LED surpassed the output per watt of the incandescent light, it allowed for the same power to have heaps more light. Right. And I was watching the LED technology very closely and I saw a point when it crossed over 60. Now we're at like 260, you know, almost. Yeah. So 260 bits of light or 260 lumens per watt. 
And I mean, that's staggering. And, and that's why everyone switched over to LEDs. So yeah. I was tinkering with the dynamo and I made a little bit of a discovery, a kind of a unique discovery in about where the AC power worked from the dynamo. Okay. Yeah. And supposedly I wasn't correct. And so I kind of wrote <laughs> to um, engineer, the smartest guy I could possibly find in, in this guru dynamo stuff. And he was uh, in Germany. Germany, I think, and I wrote to him and I said, oh, this is what my meters are saying, you know, because I had my test meters on. Uh, and he goes, well, that can't be correct. That that you can't, that doesn't, it couldn't happen. Um, and, and well, I retested and tested and my meters kept saying the same thing. Mm. Anyway, he said, you're wrong. It's, you're wrong. It can't be right. So anyway, I kind of just, I guess, b- believed this guy and went on with my battery light. So anyway, long story short, when I got forced to kind of can the battery business and also I started to not like the batteries, I started to realize that there was an attrition and these batteries, they'd kind of wear out every two years, no matter really of the use. That's the nature of lithium polymer and to a certain lithium iron. Like after two years, your phone starts to lose charge, eh? And it's just because the battery wears out. And I thought, huh. well, you know, there's a lot of lot of wastage in this. Surely that's got to be better. And then on the other side, we've got LEDs being super powerful per lumen, right? I started to go, hey, wait a minute. We've got super high power LEDs here just coming out. We've got my little dynamo kind of unique discovery only now can they match back in 2006 didn't matter because leds were bright enough didn't matter so i kind of used this kind of weird trick that i'd done to tune the dynamo because in bikes right it's all about like the extra little percentage of dialing in you know what i mean like when you're dealing with pros their bike's got to be not only schmick but like hotted up eh? Like, yeah. it's got to be worked. It's like yeah. a hot, it's got to be fucking pimped and worked to its, you know, they used to put like, pull a bull bearing out, right? And put oil, like a thick oil in there instead of grease because it was faster. You know uh, what I mean? Yeah. All this crazy shit to be better. And so that was what it was all about as a race mechanic. And so I was like, okay, we're going to fucking tweak this dynamo. <laughs> so I fucking tuned the dynamo. So it can produce like more power down the bottom end, right? Okay. Yeah. That the catalyst low speed power booster. And so, it no basically no one does it unless you have copied my design. No <laughs> one does it. And so all the power is kind of past twenty, because that's why they did it. That's the way it was meant for. You know what I mean? That's the design, and that design's been repeated time and time again. So most of the power is not is in the medium band. There's very little power is in the low band. Like it's got nothing, eh? And so most dynamo lights, like to be honest, they're a little bit dim down the low end. Yeah. You know, like some plug a battery in, but like, dude, fuck the batteries, man. Fuck them. Fuck the batteries. <laughs> fuck. Them. They're gonna wear out. Gonna leave you short. Like they just bypass that technology. Just get away from them. Super yeah. capacitive, it's called AC generator technology. That's what's cool, man. I'll just tell you that right yeah. now. Yeah. Well, I have um, I have your uh, I have your K light. I have your what do I have? The, 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 the huh? The little gold, the little gold one. Right? Yeah. Yeah, it's cute. It started super tiny, right? And you have to admit, down low, it's got some decent grunt to it. You yeah, know I, mean? I mean, I'd say above six miles an hour. I don't know what the kilometers are, but um, yeah, I mean, just not pedaling. You know, you're getting a good a good beam of light. Yeah, so about thirteen k an hour for uh, for Aussies, um, it starts to give you know pretty decent output, and it peaks at eighteen, whereas normally it peaks lower down. And I've managed to put in look a little resonant peak in the power band just. To, to tweak a little bit more power out of the hub than, of course, a standard light would at the lower end. And so um, if you think of a, the device having kind of like a bell curve, we all know what a bell curve is, yeah. right? 
And so the peak of the waveform is kind of like in the middle, the highest point's in the middle, right? What I've done, if you can imagine a little peak down low and then kind of flattens out, it's not a bell curve anymore. It's pushed over to the left. Like you yeah. grab your finger in the bell curve, you push it over to the left. Yes. There's a little kind of groove over to the left down low. Um, you don't get more power after 18. It, it's kind of the same. Yes. It, yeah. It's all down low. And that's yeah. for mountain bike. That's called the low speed power booster. Right. Okay. And that's why it works so good because like when you're mountain biking, you're not, you're not doing 25, 30 k an hour. Like yeah. seriously, average speeds like 12 to 18 kilometers an hour or like, you know, 12 mile an hour or something, you know, yeah. average speeds. Or if you're good, bike touring, good, good bike packing, totally. you know, that, you're carrying a bunch of weight, you can't can't go that fast. So I'm, I'm, cu- <laughs> I'm curious. I um, My first Dynamo light was yours. So I, I, I've never tried... <laughs> Yeah. I've never, oh, there I've never tried any other lights, so I don't really know. But I'm curious, like what what do you think makes your lights the best? Is it the low the low range? Well, it's a combination of everything, and 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 let's. I'm just gonna pretend that you've actually just got the latest ultra version. Um, I mean, that's that's three times brighter. It has individual beams for different uses. So it's got like a high beam built in and then like a wide beam built in as well. And they kick in and out at different times and like it's a totally different beast, right? So Oh, it does it automatically so you're not manually switching it? The switch on your light's more of a, a, a regular light and then the boost light. And so it is a bit confusing and that's why we dropped it. We don't have that confusing switch. <laughs> we got rid of that. Um, now it does it automatically, right? But this time on the new ultra version, they're three different optics and, yeah. and, and two of them are different shape than one of them, the other one. So essentially there's a high beam and a low beam. There's the wide beam and then the spotty kicks in, right? So assuming, um, you've got that light. Let's just assume you've got the new light. So what makes the difference is a whole bunch of things that I kind of tweaked to be as best as I can. And then when you chuck a whole bunch of things together, the result is a whole lot of really good shit. <laughs> like, uh, real quick, it's ballsy bright because the new optics are square, right? So everyone's still using flashlight bloody optics, right? Oh, I still do it in the Goldie. You've got flashlight optics in your Goldie, right? It's yeah. round. And, like, yeah. that's great. But there's, like, push into the trees, man, that you're wasting, right? Okay. So I put these square optics in it, right? You can't see them because they're round in shape. They're square and beam, right? Interesting. Okay. Okay, so I've taken the light from the trees and I've, I've jammed it into the main beam. Okay, so that's that's cool. That's cool. So that's square tech optics, right? Yeah. And then we've got the different types of square tech optics that kick in at different speed to give you an overall beam pattern that is superior than just your single optic. Okay, so firstly, it's not round. They're square. Then they do different things. So like your car, you can't, you don't go around all day on your high beams on. Like you don't. <laughs> Right, you've got low beams, yeah. right? And the low beams, because they don't shine off things and reflect off things and glare off trees and stop signs and all that, right? So you've got low beams. We're right around all low beams and then you yeah. flick your high beams on, right? A car doesn't have freaking round beams. That's flashlights have got round beams, yeah. right? And flashlight technology and the optics, that's what bikes have had to use. So we use round beams. But round beams be gone, bro, because... It's all about the square beams to maximize that light output, not into the trees, but then folded back into the main kind yeah. of thing. So, so what you're saying is my light is outdated and I need to buy a new K light. And it's better than current LED lights. Like seriously, they all have round beams, all of right. them. Yeah. Like, my light's still twice as bright as even the closest version, right? So it's still kick-ass has got the low-speed power booster. But when you combine that low-speed power booster with 
an all-in-one light. So the new light's all-in-one now, eh? There's no extra box. They've incorporated all-in-one, mm -hmm. right? So low-speed power booster, all-in-one box, square tech optics, right? And these optics, there's two of them, or one of them, depending on which version you have, is a spot. So, like, it's punchy as fuck, right? And so at the right speed, like it kicks in and mm. throws down the road, just like your high beam does when you're on the highway, man. You bang them on, throw down the road. I can see the kangaroos wanting to leap out on you. Giant fucking moose on a bloody <laughs> with pack gear and mountain lions and all that shit, right? So you put it on high beam, right? But of course you've got the wide there going at the normal. You don't turn the your regular lights off. Like the, the wides are still on. It's just a high beam kick in. So you've still got the wide yeah. there. And the wide does a very different job. Like in this case, if you have, it's 180 degree beam, right? So it's ultra fucking wide. And that's why it's called the ultra. It's ultra <laughs> wide, right? You can't have an ultra wide light by itself. It's not going to work. You're like shit, right? That's why I've got to have the spot. But because I've got the two different types, I can have a super fucking spot, like that's super punchy, and at the same time, super wide. So I've, the gap between the two types of light is huge. So it's super spotty and super wide. And by mixing them together and they blend and, you know, organically yeah. change at the right speed, you've got the best overall light rather than a single. Every other light has just got one optic. Okay, mm -hmm. it might be a wide optic, might be an arrow, but it's just only one. Right. There might be some LEDs in that optic, but it's still only one type of optic. Is that the future of K-Light then? Do you think that's that's where you're going to go with all your lights? I've spent four years designing this light. It better be, eh? <laughs> I, can't, I can't wait another four years. No, look, this is, I've maximized the technology. Like, I've absolutely tweaked the shit out of it. This is a 10-year design. I've been, I invented this in 2006, and wow. I've been making it better and better and better and better. And then I got the like the little mixy thing where it mixes it all in. And I thought, shit, if I'm doing this mixy thing, I can have the different beams. So I integrated different beams. And then I got the square tech optics. And then I got it all together in one thing. And then we're gonna get it like fancy molded, right? And so it gets even smaller, eh? Oh. So what I see on your website is not the finished finished product. Well, this is just what we're working with with the 3D print machines, eh? And so basically these machines, they cost like, you know, $35,000, right, for the machine. Okay. Right? Then the tools cost you 15000 right? But you can chunk a chunk a chunk a chunk of them out with no case, and it's just the molding inside. But then we shape the molding to look like a light, so essentially it gets smaller, right? It, it's a very costly way to get smaller, but that's like the ultimate, right? And... So the design has each maturity. Like it's not going to get more amazing than this, yeah. but it's way amazing than you can imagine. So so you go, oh, I've got the old one. Yeah, that's that good. So this is going to be this good, right? When you get it, it's like twice as better. So that <laughs> this, that's mind blow, man. Like yeah. seriously, like way better than you can imagine. That's what Dude, I say. Dude, you're selling me right now. You're making me want <laughs> I love my K light, but you're making me want to. You're gonna make me want a new K light. I tell you, all the test riders have been telling me shit, right? So I don't get to test ride at thousands and thousands and thousands of kilometers. I oh, seriously, I don't have time. So no. I have these test riders, and what they've told me is that the ultra wide beam reduces their helmet light use by eighty percent. Okay. So instead Let of being out on the tour divide, stressing about your helmet light running out and going, oh, shit, I've got to conserve batteries, the ultra-wide beam, like, you don't need it. You don't need it. So it's only then for map reading. You know, it's only then for... Or dogs. I don't know. Yeah. Or yeah. mountain lions or kangaroos. Right. And, and so that's one aspect, reducing the helmet light use by a fair bit. Uh, the stand light lasts for about an hour. Right. And there's still no batteries. Like, you don't need the battery. Holy right? shit. What's the stand light on the uh, bike packer, the one that I have, the Goldie, as you call it? I like that name. It's, it's probably probably half. So it probably lasts for about half an hour of visible light because we've yeah. tweaked the optics. We now get about an hour of usable light to set your tent up, right? Yeah. So the whole idea is wide beam. You park your bike against a tree or on a stick in the desert or whatever, and, and, and you get to see pitch your tent. So... Mm. So no. I know that long-winded way to answer your question, but long story short, low-speed power booster, 
customized optics that are square that then blend in like super wide to, to, to spot it just when you need it, eh? Just like when you want more light. Like, oh, it gives you more light. Oh, perfect. You know, and it's the spotlight. You know what I mean? You don't want a spotlight flaring off trees in single track at low, mm. at, like, you know what I mean? So that's why in single track it just does wide only, you know? How, how does it switch between what beam it should be doing? Do you? It knows how fast you're going. Because really? it's connected to the okay. dynamo. Yeah. So it counts the frequency. And so... As you move faster, the wheel goes around faster. On a wheel level, on the on a dynamo wheel level, that's AC frequency, and the frequency changes. So we just go, yep, we're at this frequency. Yep, now's the time to kick in. So does okay, and does the rider have any manual controls over that if they wanted to override and say, hey, I want to hit that? They used to, but now they don't. And it's mainly to do with the racer ethic. Like it's 3 a.m., your brain is fucked. I, there's nothing that I can do on this light to make it not work or do work. You know what I mean? Mm. It's just like it's, either, it's automatic. You know what I mean? You don't have to fuck with it. You don't have to think, oh, fuck, did I leave that setting on or is that setting? Is that, you know, no, nah, you can just pedal. That's it. It's fully yeah. automatic. Just like the USB charge is now fully automatic. Okay. All right. So this is a bike packing show primarily. Um, describe, tell us what you think is the best bike packing setup, dynamo, light, power bank, everything. Like what, what would you recommend as being the best for like an extended bike packing trip? Let's say with limited resupplies, you know, like you're not going to be going through gas stations. You need to rely on your dynamo to power what you have. What do you go with? Well, I, I think the number one thing is um, navigation. So I, I always start from there and go down. So nav- for me, like if the trail's covered in snow or you can't see the trail, man, like you don't even know which direction you're heading in, eh? Yeah. And that that fucks you in the head and you're going to crack and then you're going to stop moving. And if you stop moving, you die, right? So we don't want that. And so <laughs> navigation is, is is the most important thing. And, yeah, you can use your phone, but don't fucking do it, man. Like, it's your backup. Your phone's your backup to your backup. You know what I mean? So uh, phone is only GPS and emergency kind of like ring ring. It's it's not good enough. It's it's not enough redundancy. So K Light's all about three level redundancy. You go into the fucking moon, man. You've got to <laughs> like seriously. You've got to set up for going to the moon, having everything as back up to your back up to your back up. Three levels, yep. right? So wa- yeah, so, walk us through what that looks like. Okay, so for me, E Trex, um, because it's AAs, right? So that's your like. If you let's just go, you're you're totally fucked. You're not going fast enough or you're pushing or something's broken or whatever. You know, if you need to have a redundancy, it's when everything's fucked. So basically AAs on your e tracks and new e tracks the X versions, they've got um, a battery save mode that turns the screen off. Man, you last for four days on batteries. Like it's a seriously smart thing to do. So your AA-powered e tracks as your ultimate backup, yeah, they're a little bit hard to read. I've got a little hack file to make them work really cool. So like <laughs> if you've got e tracks definitely jump on the website and, and download that. It's all really easy now. It's in one little profile. You just add it. Turns your e tracks into like magic. Just works for bike packing, eh? So e tracks awesome. They've got them on special because the new 22s and the 32s come out. So the new 30X, the 30X is the one to get because it's got live mapping. So like when you turn, the map turns, mm. whereas the cheaper ones, you've got to move a little bit before it orientates your map. Mm. And so you don't want to be going down the hill and go, oh, fuck, I've got to go back up the hill, right? Uh. And so the 30X is on special, more than good enough. Got a new nice screen, 30X e tracks You might have another like a Wahoo or another uh, USB one. So if I drain a, a normal GPS, I've got to wait to charge it like often before I come back on if it's got an internal battery. And so having that AI battery, man, instant, boom, nav, I'm on. You know what I mean? Yeah. So e tracks with AAs, ultimate backup. You can run AAs. You don't have to have AAs. You can have no AAs in it and just plug it into USB and it'll run. You okay. can plug it directly into my USB charger and it'll run from 7.9 kilometers an hour. Wow. Right? 
No. Uh, back up to back up to back up to back up. Kalite's all about redundancy when shit happens. Yeah. This is what I've built with. Like, okay, I haven't cool. been sitting thinking about one thing. Look, there's many layers to the Kalite onion. I can tell you that right now. Yeah, so Let's peel them back. E-Trex, no battery, straight to USB charger, all good, it'll run, it'll nag you when you stop, but that's fine, you didn't have your cache because your cache is flat because you, you fucked it up and you left your phone on or whatever, right? <laughs> phone, you don't want to be charging your phone on the go because you're going to fuck the little socket, right? And so what happens is the little tiny wimpy little sockets and all the phones, all our USB cache wiggle around and they're bouncing around in your bag and they jiggle and they kind of lose their ability to, to connect the little tiny connectors. Mm. And so you want to kill a cache, eh? You want to kill a USB $20 cache. You don't want to kill your $1,000 iPhone 10, right? True. So seriously, if you are charging it, it's not in battery save mode and it's possibly sucking, like, power, like, to get keep it going while it's charging. When it's in airplane mode or when it's off, it's sucking no, or very little or no power. Okay. And so you essentially want to have your phone in airplane mode all the time, if not turning it off, and then charging it. If you can charge it off, that's great. Uh, and charging it at night time when you're not moving. Like, that's the golden situation. It's not going to happen every time. Sometimes you have yeah. to plug it in. Just but better to kill a USB cache battery from vibration on the socket than your nice phone, okay? So phone, backup, backup, use an app. There's Ride with GPS. There's gear maps. There's a lot of really good what we call offline GPS applications, and so it means you don't need to be online and you've already downloaded yeah, the yeah, map of the yeah. area. So yeah, those are some good set, ones. Some good ones out there. Like, that's a must. That's a no-brainer, right? If you're on Android, you can OTG. So OTG plugs directly to your phone. Your phone then works like a little PC. And you can push files, like corrupt, say your file, your E-Trex corrupts and you need a file. Okay, the file's sitting on your phone, right? You've emailed yourself the file, right? <laughs> your little tracks, your GPX file, right? You can OTG in the field to your E-Trex, eh? Wow. From your Android device, right? Fucking hot tip. <laughs> That's that one, right? <laughs> so phone backup, E-Trex, ultimate backup, as we've explained, you might have a Wahoo because that's super cool to follow. The maps are really nice and that's a really intuitive modern interface. The Garmin, hey, it's a little bit clunky, but hey, it's solid, it's reliable, and you may need to back up to it once a Wahoo runs out of power, eh? Because whatever, you had it on <laughs> ultra bright mode. Ultra bright so, mode. <laughs> uh, backup phone is your E-Trex. And if you can have another um, GPS, great. Uh, or it could just be your e tricks in your phone. And that's a really cheap way to do it, eh? What about a map? Do it. Yep, if you're a map reader person, take your maps for sure. Whatever yeah. gets you through. Uh, a lot of guys have a cue sheet or a map on the front. Uh, they might have a little clipboard or a little bit of plastic or something. That's super handy. Uh, or a sticker. Uh, you might have your little readouts to your next town. So you go, oh, okay, I'll go, yeah. your, your mind's mush and you go, oh, yeah, I've got to stop here. Yeah, yeah. got to read here got to make sure i do it should i got to get to this point before this time eh? yeah right. before and something wanna, closes yeah if you want to quit pit stop and if you can find wall power hey like steal power from the wall eh, rather than your body and yeah. like if you have your quick charge format like definitely cross over to the new quick charge usb cache format three times quicker recharge so then you're stealing more power real quick you might have an hour right that you're washing resupplying, getting your water, whatever, and then you're back on the bike. And so if you've got that quick charge format, you're in an advantage, eh? What is that? That's another product that you all sell? I'm looking on your website. Not my product. It's simply a new format that exists on the market that charges okay. heaps quicker, eh? USB. Jump on my Insta TV thing and videos on Insta. Uh, pictures of what to get, what caches come with quick charge format or the new USB PD quick charge format. All the information's there for you guys. So, yeah, quick charge is quicker. Get a cache battery that's quick charge. Oh, that's cool. You get 
you get the right one and it'll keep your e-trex charged but it'll also charge itself so daisy chain it from the k light usb charger to the cache then through to your gps whether that's e-trex or whatever uh, and then everything gets topped up eh? yep and so yep. that's the kind of daisy awesome. chain or I don't even bother. I don't even bother plugging the GPS. I've got an E-Trex. It lasts for four days, like, you know, from AA batteries, et cetera. Uh, I made myself an AA DI2 battery, uh, <laughs> keeping it simple. Uh, I made a, it's, uh, a rechargeable DI2 battery, so I don't need the charger. Um, just keep it really simple. Um, so we've gone over GPSs. Yeah. Uh, we've got, uh, like, seriously, it doesn't matter what equipment you've got. Like, seriously, you don't need to go out and spend the money on K-Light. You don't. You don't. Okay. You, you don't. I, I was super fucking stoked, like, 20 years ago, rolling around, getting super excited, rolling down dirt roads on cantilevers, man, and panniers. Like, I was yeah. stoked. I, yeah. I, I had the old shifters, XT, little thumb shifters, man. They yeah. rocked. Yes. <laughs> like, just like rigid forks. I loved it. Like you don't need, you don't need the fancy equipment, right? Yeah. But if you can afford good equipment, start with a hub. Start with your Dynamo hub, right? Man, you are preaching the bikes or death motto right now. You don't need the fancy equipment. I love that. Well, look, you've got to, man, it's like, I'm not going to be, uh, say you've got to fucking wank out with $10,000 bike and fucking all the shit to have fun. That's yeah. just not the, man, you, like I think, certain people have gone out with cutoffs and fucking steel cap boots and just proven that <laughs> get out there and fucking do it. It doesn't matter how you do it. As long Shout as you out fucking to Alexandra. Yeah. Man, like just get out there and do it. Like, yeah, it's going to be hard. Yeah. You're going to cry, but like everyone's got to go through that. You know yeah. what I mean? It's life changer, man. Like I, I don't know anyone that hasn't gone out there and it hasn't changed their life. You know what yeah, I mean? Like being sure. out there, you know that moment when you realize like if something happens here, I'm fucked, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, that I've been there. moment is a special moment, man. And the first time that happens, yeah, it's fucking freaky, but that's a life changer. That's when yeah. you go, you either sit there and keep crying, right? And you might sit there for a couple of hours, right? But then it gets to a point where, oh, well, <laughs> you've got to kind of stand up, keep going. Yeah. And then that's the life changer there. It's yeah, like, that's oh, when, well, that's when you find out who you really are. Yeah, it's in that, the, it's in it's in those moments. It's in those moments where you you're you're really faced with who you are deep down at your core, and you get an opportunity to look deep inside and be like, "All right, you got it. Are you going to go forward? Or are you going to just sit here and cry like you're saying?" Those are special moments. You've got to leave something behind. You got to leave the old you behind, eh? Yeah. You've got to work with the new you. You know, you kind of break out of the shell. I think, in some cosmic way, it's like for me, that's why they call it cracking. Like I cracked, and I almost like cracked the old shell off, and like got rid of that. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. because I, the first time you do it, you're always like heaps tougher than you think you are, right? Like that's <laughs> they keep telling you that. Like it's so true, man. Like. Yes. It's so much tougher. You know, that, yeah. they say great men are forged in fire, right? That's the fire. That's the fire they're talking about. That fucking, you crack, you know, you're crying, you're upset, you want to quit, man. But yeah. like, you can't because you're, you're too far in the middle of nowhere. So you're forced to keep going. And you're <laughs> half an hour later, you go, oh, I feel a bit silly now. Oh, this is mm. all right. Yeah. Just keep but on the weird going. part is that in those moments, you're the only person there. You know, so that that's the fire, I guess, that you're talking about. I mean, it's the fire inside of you that's going to push you to keep going or or not. You know, like, well, there, there's nobody started, else that's going to. You huh? started to show that you're a, a high school dropout, right? And you, you, you're yeah. electrical challenged, sure. right? Yeah. I was homeless, man. Well, like, I was in the gutter, it's like going, well, you know, this is shit, right? But. In some way, it breaks you, but then you rebuild yourself and go, well, I've just got to get on with it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I think each one that's been broken enough or been, you know, pushed enough to, to, to break, I think 
it's that rebuilding and kind of the new you mm. and, uh, getting on with it. And so, like, I I was already in the gut. I had nothing to lose with K-Light, man. Yeah. It's like I've been a I all my life. Like, and I've been super lucky. Like, when I was 15 and I was, like, semi-homeless, this dude, like, he said, come live with me, eh? Like, he was, like, this super cool dude. He was ranked number three in Australia. Like, and so I got thrust at, like, 15, 16 into Wait, the, he was the, ranked number three in what? Oh, uh, in mountain biking. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Just a second. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So he was, like, a mad nutter and, like, work, all he'd done is work at bike shops all his life. And so he took me under his wing, eh? And he kind of taught me kind of pro mechanics. And I was his best disciple, eh? Like, we were the bike bastards and we would <laughs> strip a, a bike fully down and like rebuild it with love before we sold it. Like that's what we did. That's like awesome. that back when nobody did that. You know, that was the nineties. And I was a wheel builder, right? So I'd I'd pull the wheels down to their threads and like lure them all up and then dish them, tension them. So every wheel was bloody hot. Like I've built like five thousand fucking wheels, man. Like seriously, <laughs> my arm is rooted. And that's why I had to get rid of bike mechanics. But anyway, um, it's all about that love that dialing in you know because he was a racer you know i had to be you know the bottom bracket had to be chased and faced and re-lubed so it doesn't creak and the headset had to put grease in it because they didn't have grease in them like they're a bit better now but back in the day they didn't have grease in them they were kind of like dry hmm. um so we got our name for what we did you know and he taught me to be fully professional and so i guess i followed that through the whole way you know what i mean i want the lights to be fully professional i, I want them to to serve you like so i, I They've actually built with a life of 10 years. I don't know if off of that was warranty, um, but there's no batteries in them and they've got super capacitors in them and it's like really good technology, like all the new electric cars are using. Uh, a battery will last two years, whereas super caps will last 10. So I've still got lights, a little goldie, still running eight years, nine years later, eh? It's like probably not the best, smartest idea from a business perspective. <laughs> no, I guess that's life. <laughs> Whatever. Yeah. I just, uh, actually, I just today released my interview with Vince Colvin from Chumba. They're a bike manufacturer here in the United States. And uh, we, had, we had a similar conversation where, you know, from a business model perspective, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't fit the mold with what's standard in our culture and society where you everything is expendable, you know, everything is cheap, everything breaks and you throw it away. I was on my bike ride tonight, you know, and I was, there's heaps of trash on the side of the road um, where people are throwing with couches and lamps and whatever, you know, I mean, they just, they buy it and they just throw it on the side of the road and a truck comes and grabs it and throws it in a landfill and they don't worry about it anymore. Yeah I, yeah, I can't handle that shit. Like, I guess, you know, at a heart, I'm probably a little bit of a hippie type person and, you know, I want good for the world and I want to reduce our carbon footprint. And, you know, that's some of the driving force between the design, you know, to have it all locally made and, you know, um, we're not shipping stuff all around the world before we even start. You know, sure, I've got to ship it to bike shops in America and all that sort of stuff and that's necessarily evil. Um, but yeah, that low carbon footprint, that, you know, renewable 10 year sort of plan, uh, it can only be better, Yeah. you know, and, and if you're a commuter, you know what I mean? You don't want to stuff with, with, with your bike. You, you don't want to have to worry about a battery. Like, oh, can I go out to the movies or do I, do I have to charge it first or do oh, I drain man. it first? Yeah. You know what I mean? far out like i get panicked when i'm less than 50 percent of my phone like you know five percent like that yeah whatever you know there's but, a there's a rap song yeah. about that from little dicky where he talks about how he's got like um less than 10 percent on his phone and he's like having a panic attack or something like that you know but it's true you know people like oh man that that's a whole different topic whenever we talk about our addiction to phones but it just made me think about that well, in some way, I serve that addiction with my new dual USB charger. You can plug in your phone Ooh. and your spot tracker at the same time. Tell us and about it. Your spot tracker, right? This is the juice. Okay, so dang, 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 hot tip alert coming up. <laughs> hot tip. So, your spot tracker, right, 
we're worried about the batteries running flat, eh? Because, like, wifey's at home going, Oh, fuck, he stopped. Fuck, he stopped. He stopped <laughs> at the shops. Oh, is he all right? Oh, he looks like he's scratching his eyes. Oh, my God, I'm freaking out. Right, so we've got to have the batteries in the spot, rigid edge. Right? <laughs> but they run out, and, like, it's hard to know. The, like, it might flash red, but, like, is that flashing red or is it too bright sunlight or, you know, so you can't check it every minute. So the whole idea, right, is it doesn't use its batteries under Kalite USB power. So, like, the second port, like, you've got your case plugged into one port, right? We all know that, right? Okay. And you're charging your case, which is charging your phone. But there's a second port. You plug your spot tracker into the second port. Now, your spot tracker doesn't use its batteries. All day when you're moving, it's using Dynamo power. Because yeah. it draws bugger all, right? It draws bugger all because it's like an intermittent device, right? So it doesn't need much. So you can run everything at the same time. Yeah. But the main thing is not using its batteries, right? Only time it uses its batteries is it auto switches to batteries when you stop. So like you, when you're not, you can plug it into your cache, I guess, and it'll keep going. Um, but it'll diverts to its own batteries when the dynamo stops working. Yep, when you stop. Uh, and that's the only time it's using its own batteries. Now, given that, you know, you, you're either going to turn off at night or whatever, maybe you don't turn off at night, um, it means your power is going to last like 10 times longer on that spot. And there's one more thing that you don't have to stuff around with because of the second port on that K-Lite dual USB charger where you can have your spot auto-diverting between battery and USB-A like oh. that is one less thing to stuff around with. You can have it hardwired, man. You could go the whole trip, right? You could do a whole TD, right, just on one set of batteries and with a spare. Wow. So we got distracted a little bit. That's obviously a component of what you think is the best bikepacking setup. So we got the uh, we got the GPS device. What, what? I think I know what light you're going to recommend. <laughs> Any light. Like, seriously, start with the hub. And this is where I got sidetracked. You're, you're right there. Thanks for bringing me back. So any hub, like SP hubs have stopped coming back, right? So they had a little bit of a bearing issue when they went over to the thicker axle. They didn't change the shell size and therefore they reduced the actual balls in the bearings rather than just putting bigger bearings in, right? And there's a few problems with bearings, but like I've got a guy in the factory and he's, they're not coming back anymore, right? So they've fixed a bearing issue. They've Bigger shell, bigger bearings. It's all rigid. Did. So SP are the best value hubs, eh? Like if you've got a nine mil old school bike, like with a nine mil quick release, right? Not the through axle stuff. They're yeah. dirt cheap, man. And they've got the rigid edge bearings. They're, they're lasting like 30,000 Ks, man. Like seriously. I've got 25,000 Ks on customers on these. Wait a second. Wait a second. Wait a second. So hubs. The nine mil ones, they are the gold fucking secret, eh? The little nine mil QR on your old school rigid edge bike, right? Those dudes are killing it. They last forever, those hubs. SP, super cheap. Start well, with that. You don't even sell those on your website. No hubs. Huh? I've got, I've got time to sell hubs. I've got fucking shit to be inventing. No, I don't sell anything. No, I don't, I don't direct with deal with customers at all. I just deal with the, the dealers but, uh, in each country. But on your website, if I go to K Light, the, yeah, the that's, that's, that's American. You're on the American website. Don't don't be fooled. It's not the Australian website. The Australian website's got nothing on it. It's just yeah, for dealers only, really. Yeah. So on the American website, they sell hubs and they cater to every need that you may have, sir, including super hot K Light designed E Trex mounts, incorporated, blah blah blah, sexy sexy, ooh, <laughs> hot girl. <laughs> Oh, look, it's here. It's good. Like what America does compared to what I do. Like I've got it all set up for them. They've got, I've got Shay Linda there, man. He's like, he's like ex Cannondale sponsored writer, right? Mm -hmm. So knows his shit. Really pedantic in particular. Like yeah. to have him here is like such an asset, eh? It's yeah, break like, this down. I'm, I'm pretty curious. Like I'm in the US market. And so there's like a website just for me. And then there's a website for everybody else. What, what's no, no, no. The website that Australians, real quick, that's for dealers. Yeah, so the, the dealers around the world can log on to the international website, order what they want, um, and then people in their country, like South Africa, South Korea, the Netherlands, um, like 
all these cool places, they've got dealers. So you just go to your local place, you get quick shipping. You know, that dude knows what you need, man. He knows the area. He knows the conditions. He's the expert in your area. So Shay in, in the US, he's the expert. He knows what's going on for your conditions. He's doing the new cube lights, which is the first flashing dynamo light. Uh, and it draws next to no power yet. It's super bright and it's got a special anti-glare optic. That's bullshit good. Uh, he's he's doing them, building them under license. He's doing the wheels. He's doing everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay. Uh, yeah. Start so with I... a hub. Uh, it's super good. If you can afford a Son hub, the German-made hub, like German against Taiwanese, they're German hubs are better. Um, a bit more sexier and more money. So, I mean, start with the hub. Doesn't matter which hub you can have to afford. Well, let me, right? let me, can, can I stop you there real quick? Cause I'm curious. Yeah. I, um, I'm, you, you and I don't know each other. I'm, I've done one like really, uh, big bikepacking event. I've done quite a few trips. Um, but like I started in bikepacking like two years ago and I started with an SP hub. I got 27 miles out of it and it crapped out, just stopped working. They warranted it, you know, which is great. But I was about to do a 500 mile race and I wanted a product that I could count on. So I bought the Sun 28. But I'm, I'm curious, move. huh? Smart move. So, but you were talking about the SP. Uh, there was an issue with that they fixed with the bearings. Is that maybe what happened yeah, to yeah. me? Yeah, well, look, Basically, there's SP of just sort of when they started, I, I was a direct dealer and I worked with them directly with the factory and I worked with the, the top honcho and I really tried to, to help them. But they were early in and they had some teething problems with some of the bearings. Um, and I think they've kind of admitted that now. And, you know, we had a bit of a falling out and I said, look, I'm going to go my way. I'm not going to sell hubs because I was affected by the problems and I was trying to help them and tell them how to fix stuff. And But, you know, long story short, the guy at the factory, my main guy there, he's he just doesn't get the volume of them back, you know what I mean? And so he tells me that, that the issues are fixed. Okay. And, and I know that personally my SP... I've, I've done thousands on it, you know, and I know many people that have done thousands yeah. and thousands of days on them. And you don't tend to hear those people, but you definitely get an over-representation of, of failures on the internet. Yeah. And so, yeah, they copped a bit of flack, eh? and I think they really felt it, you know what I mean? But I, I feel confident that it's a rare occasion, you know, yeah. like shit breaks occasionally. Sun, if you can afford it, get a sun, eh? Yeah. Get a sun. I've, I've heard of sun breaking, but that's only after they get fully worn out, eh? You yeah. know what I mean? Um, so I think you can get any hub. You know, I, mean, I think it's unlikely if you have a drama, you know, and if you can afford an SP, uh, don't let the fact that you need a sun hub stop you from getting out. You know what I mean? Like there's a good chance even on these old school 9 mil quick QR bikes, those hubs are going to last 25,000 K. You know what I mean? Like that's what I'm seeing. That's the experience that yeah. I've had. Um, so old school bikes, that that's a little gold nugget, that SP QR hub. The, the through axles now got better bearings. So look, they they got different shells. They're going good. They got a new 12 mil Shimano. Have just come out with a new hub, like ultra efficient. Haven't tried it. Don't know if it's low powered. Stay away from the low powered hubs. Like if it's got if it's got like 2.4 watt written on it, or 1.5 watt, like that's not <laughs> going to cut it. Like that's not going to do much. So get get the full three watt hubs, uh, which is Sun 28. Yes, that's what I have. And PD8X in SP. Yeah, uh, that's the through axle version. Well, I'm glad I'm glad you uh, talked a little bit about SP because I've had uh, not on the podcast because I'm not here to blast any company necessarily unless I think they need it. But I don't, you know, I never I don't hold SP accountable. Like sometimes shit breaks, like you said, right? My mine broke. They warranted it. They did what they were supposed to do. They stand behind their product. Great, but I've had interesting conversations with people some people like indiana schultz who uh just won the uh, american trail race he swears by his sp i mean he's got 
well over 10,000 miles on his. So it, it's kind of good to get a little bit more of the story on that. Well, it was awful for me because, like, up until then, shit didn't fail, eh? Like, but the hubs were expensive, right? So you couldn't get shit hubs, right? You couldn't get any hubs other than the expensive one. And shit never failed, eh? And it was great. It was living the dream, right? Yeah. And then SP, when they started out, like, it's Taiwanese. It's cheap. Uh, the, the issues with the, the early uh, cheaper hubs uh, spooked the market a little bit. It was a bit disappointing to see. Um you know, from perspective of it's pretty reliable normally, and then SP had some issues at the start. So it, it does appear that they're behind them, and so I, I think you could still go with, with, with SP. But please be aware that on the website they do write that it's not for extreme uh, expeditions and extreme mm. touring. So that is a caveat that they have on their website now. Yeah. So if you are doing that, you know, stuff and, and it's your number one priority. I think it's worth saying now that you should really uh, spend the money in and get a Sun, okay. uh, S-O-N, Sun 28. Yeah. Uh, I think that's a worthy investment. I have both. Uh, my SP has been doing more Ks than my Sun's done. Um, I think the Sun's probably a little bit nicer underfoot, I think. It does feel a little bit smoother the way that they kind of arrange their claws and poles. So I think the sun kind of has, has the edge for me. Uh, but definitely get out there, whatever hub you've got, yeah, and just start with a charger. Like you can get a K-Lite charger or any cheap USB charger uh, and go direct to hub and you can just use a cheap USB rechargeable light. You know what I mean? Like right in the day, fucking enjoy it. Don't, don't be caught out with having to have freaking everything like you just gotta <laughs> like seriously just if you can get the hub that's great if you can't get the hub get a quick charge power bank and get like a decent size one yeah they're ugly they're heavy and they can break and they can crap out but like just as a bare minimum a big cache battery that's quick charge you can get away with otherwise if it's not quick charge you're waiting around for hours to kind of get power and if that's your only way to survive it's not a good way yeah. because this is the golden rule right conditions can change doubling the same distance so sorry the the the, the doubling the time for the same distance yeah and so if your batteries lasts X time and then suddenly you've doubled the time because it's snow and you're walking through the snow or whatever for the same distance, all your calculations are out. It's, it's all out. Yeah. So the ability to have power on demand, so when you need power to have power there, you, you, that is where the gold is because conditions change. So it's only when things go shit do the dynamos, you go, oh, fuck, thank Christ, you know, I'm out here for heaps longer, you know what I mean? Or, yeah. you know, my phone's gone. I gone do down. know I what you mean. Yeah. I got to tell you a story about um, when when things went wrong. Um, I did a 500-mile gravel race bikepacking event, self-supported, and uh, on the morning of day three, I woke up, and all my navig my my Garmin and my phone were both dead, so all my navigation was gone. I didn't have a map. I didn't even. I was so tired when I went went to bed. I didn't even remember what direction I was supposed to be going, and I didn't have any backup batteries. Wow. This this was my first event, but I had a Son Dynamo hub, and I had these sine waves. Uh, reactor or whatever it's called. Yeah, yeah, the little Revo that we used to sell with the K-Light system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I rode it back and forth up and down the ground like a mile back and forth until it charged. Like, yeah, it wasn't wow. pretty, but I never worried for a second. Like, I was kind of lost. I mean, you know, I could ride my bike and find a house and call somebody. I wasn't in distress, but in terms of the race that I was doing, I was like, okay, I need to get back on route. All my navigation is gone, but I got a, I got a dynamo hub. I got a, I got a charger. All I got to do is ride my bike a little bit. I'll get it going again. That's, that is powerful. That that's important that you have that when everything goes wrong, batteries will die, but having a dynamo hub that can charge whatever it is that you need to rely on, 
That's that's important. So so I'm going to come out with all these videos and they're going to be cool and they're going to show me one of the videos are going to be when things go wrong. Good. Right. Yeah. So look, in my position, if something's happening and someone's freaking out, I'll get a call. Oh, what's going on here? 95% of the time it's they didn't really understand the system and that's because it's a bit complex, right? And they didn't, you know, uh, yeah, they were charging. It just wasn't happening as quick as they would have liked. It's not It's not 2.1 amps from the dynamo, unfortunately. Uh, it's a little bit slow. So anyway, I got a call one time and this guy's had a bit of a crash and he's um, done something. He's like, I reckon he's ripped ripped some wiring or something's happened and doesn't know what's happening. All he knows is he's got no power and that's what he needs that power for the nav. Right. So I said, okay, well, he's, he just rolled into town. He got service. I said, go to a cafe, right? Grab a drink. Like just chill out. Like have, and I always do that first. I always try to calm him down and just say, look, take a load off. You know, you can't go forward. Just go to a cafe, you know, chill out. Yeah. Grab some hot chips or whatever, right? So they sit in the cafe. I said, all right, when you're at the cafe, grab your table fork, okay? Now, pull the plug off the dynamo. Give the wheel a little bit of a spin, and with the table fork, just short out the little pins for a sec. Okay, this is called the hub test, right? Okay, we're at a cafe. I've got a knife and a fork, right? That's what all we've got, right? So just, we're going to do it. We're just going to make it up, right? So the spark test doesn't hurt the hub, right? And it shows you that there's power there. So when we fit yeah. stuff, you chase the power, okay? So start with the power and you do the fork test and you just short it out for a speed. You get a little spark. Oh, great, great. Oh, that's good. Oh, the hub's working. Great, right? And then you do the spark test at the other end, like in my case, the yellow plugs, right? Nothing. Right. So it broken something along there. So I said, that's cool. That's cool. We're going to figure it out. Right. Um, so what we did, we got a butter knife. Right. We just chopped the wire loom up a little bit. We found the, the break. Um, we just twisted it together like speaker wires. They're really big. The wires are super easy to work on. <laughs> um, we got them going, eh? We got them rolling again. Knife and a fork fix. <laughs> you know what I mean? That spark test, chase the power up to the top, uh, swap your leads around. You know, 95% of the time people are rolling. It's very rare that I can't get someone going, you know, that we don't have a backup. Oh, he goes, oh, one guy rang up, oh, my case is fucked. Uh, fucking nothing's working and fuck, I don't know what's going on. I said, all right, relax, you know, how, relax. How often do you get those calls? Well, I'll be honest, I do support for quite a few professional riders behind the scenes okay. and I'm looking after them and sometimes shit happens. Like recently, like a guy busted a derailleur in the middle of nowhere at elevation in a storm with very minimal race gear. And it was, it was, yeah, it was pretty confronting uh, cause I knew with nothing that without moving, there's no, Dynamo, man, you got nothing. Like you got to actually be moving to do it. And that derailleur's busted off, and the chain breaker broke, and like a oh, fucking ultimate nightmare, right? I've yeah. got to get this guy going, right? Um, so you know, over the support, he's a smart guy anyway, uh, super super good racer, uh, and we, we cobbled together shit, and we got him going. You know what I mean? And it's 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 that years of bike mechanics, I guess, uh, everyone should know how to fix their own bike and everyone should have a basic understanding of those layers of redundancy and, and where to go because knowledge is super lightweight to carry. You know what I mean? So the ultimate yeah. setup yeah. is like a dynamo hub, any charger, A. Eh? If you've got a USB light because you can't afford a dynamo light, it doesn't matter. Now, you're going to get much better power direct dynamo power light rather than through usb so like you through usb light is kind of shit but hey if you can afford that's all you can afford like get out get out and do it so start with a dynamo um just a usb charge is kind of like a really good start right and just use whatever usb charge you can if you can afford a dynamo light in the future especially with the k light system it's all modular like some of them are combined it's all in one whereas mine's like it's all separate so you can start with the charge you can start with the basic lead you know and you can get the system going real cheap right uh and then you can 
pull in more stuff as you need, just get your cache battery, whatever, your, your top tube bag, whatever, um, and, and you're good to go. You can do it with panniers, you know what I mean? You can do it on uh, a $200 secondhand bike, you know, you can you can still do it. Um, the thing is you've got to remember, though, the internet kind of lulls us into a false sense of, oh, that's easy, oh, there's a guy riding in the middle of nowhere, oh, that's easy, <laughs> you know. But, man, you've got to do those mini little flash packy things and the little mini overnighters. Yeah. Like, you know, you can never underestimate the overnighter if you're a new BA yeah. and just checking all that gear, checking the systems. Like, even to roll out the door, you're going to go, oh, shit. You know, when that first time you roll out the door, you're not going to make it because yeah. something will happen and you'll be like, oh, shit. You I, know what I, mean? I so, tell people to start in their backyard. You know, if you got totally, a new, totally. new tent, I mean, whatever it is, camp in your backyard one night sleep on whatever if it's a hammock or a tent on a mattress you're going to cook whatever you know whatever your stove is camp in your backyard one night and then go on a, if you've never camped i grew up camping in the, in the woods and um and and was fortunate in that way but i find a lot of people aren't as equipped in that area and if that's the case you need to be comfortable with those that gear you need to be comfortable with knowing how to set it up and how to eat and how to whatever you know sleep and everything else you know i i think the bushcraft is one of the most under um estimated things you know people think all you need is a bike well seriously you need a bit of bushcraft you know yeah. got to know about it's not sticking your hand in some poisonous spiders or how not to sit on a snake i mean that's important <laughs> stuff to learn first i think yeah. but i mean if you're a mountain biker anyway it kind of comes to the territory like you've been mountain biking you know for a few years you're going to be pretty good but if you're new like definitely it's worth carrying a first aid kit like, you know what I mean? Uh, getting that s shit sorted because, like, now I don't crash as much like when I used to. You know what yeah. I mean? I'm a little <laughs> bit more experienced. You know what yeah. I mean? I'm not going to come off and wreck. And Yeah, shit happens. You've got to be always aware for that. But you got to really get prepared and, and, did and, you, and do your testing. Did you hear about the, uh, the Oregon man that found a guy? He was out on a bikepacking trip and he found a, a, an old man. Yeah, I read that. I, I inter read that. Yeah. I interviewed wow. him, Tomas. Wow. Yeah. Wow. yeah. It's such a good story, isn't it? It's crazy. He, uh, you know, he found, he was just along on a ride six days into his trip. And in the middle of the desert, there was a guy, a 73 year old man, just laying there near death. And yeah. talking about being prepared, he had, he, you should listen to that podcast if you get a if you uh, get a chance. It's a couple back. It's a great story. He was so well prepared, not only like physically, not only with like water and food, um, but just his ability to be calm and know what he needed to do in that moment to go through the steps and figure out the situation. He didn't know anything. He didn't know if that guy was taking a nap. He didn't know if he, you know, had been laying there for five days or if he had been laying there for five minutes. Wow. He didn't know anything. Yeah, well, that's an incredible yeah. story, isn't it? I'd love to hear that. Yeah, it's a, it's a great story. Yeah, he was really excited that he came on the uh, show to to talk about it. You know, it was it was a lot of fun to to get that. And I think it, you know, on the bike packing side, I love that that story got international attention. I mean, it was, I mean, you're in Australia, you know, he was, you, you yeah, heard, we this, heard about it. Yeah. You heard the story. He was on a bike packing trip and he was prepared and he saved a man's life. And I love that. So we're talking about being prepared, you know, and it's not only for your own good, but if you're going to go out into wild places, you say bushcraft. I love that bushcraft. You should have some, some sense about you. You should know how to fix your bike. You should know how to set up your tent and cook some food. And if yeah, things so go bad, you need to know yep. how to fix whatever it is. We, you need In Australia, we have Outward Bound, and that's a group. So there's many groups that will take you out. And I, as a young man, I, I did an Outward Bound course, um, but I've always been really interested in it. My uncle was an Antarctic rescuer, and uh, he taught me a lot of that. I was abseiling at seven, and, you know, bush is what, what I love 
doing and getting out there. There's a lot of bush in New Zealand and Australia. And so, you know, there's not a lot other than bush. So you kind of, that's what you learn. So yeah. I think it's really good to do a course and learn some skills. Like the other week, like my wife's first day uh, through work, um, the other week we were riding and this person just collapsed in front of us and we had to administer, um, we didn't have to do CPR, but she was having a seizure and so we had to hold her head and talk and know how to talk to them and uh, but do the right thing, call the right people. And, you know, so even a first aid um, course is really important. I knew a friend that had to give CPR to a person for something like 10 hours to keep them alive until help came, you know. Mm. So um, knowledge is very light to carry, sir. <laughs> so pack as much of that as you can do a bike course, watch a video, know how to change a gear cable, know how to dodge up a gear cable if one snaps and you leave her, you know, know that you can pull on a gear cable and change your gears and tie it off at a certain gear, you know, know how to do your chain, you know, know how to um, change a brake pad, know how to push a piston in that, you know, might be sitting out a little bit, you know, these are all really important skills uh, and I think uh, are important to carry besides uh, uh, the bike packing stuff. What do you think? Well, I think I agree with you. I don't want it to be, you know, because we talk about start small and you just rattled off a whole bunch of stuff, which is all true. But I don't want to scare anyone off from going out and having an adventure. So what I would say is shit is going to go wrong. You are going to break a chain. You are going to snap a, you know, derail your hanger. Um Something's going to go wrong. You're going to run out of food. You're going to run out of water. What I would say is for your first trips, make sure you're in cell phone cover- coverage and call somebody. Have a spot check. Yeah, totally. And, totally. and be able to hit yeah, the yeah. button. That's it. Have an exit strategy. You're not going out into the desert and no one will hear from you for ever. Like do a, do a small trip. Ride from your house to a local park state park i don't know what y'all have in australia but we have state parks here right ride to a state park it's 10 miles away 20 miles away whatever it is ride there camp cook have a great time and ride home and if shit goes wrong call somebody to pick you up you know and then you then you branch out from there you know all the things that you said are important and there are skills that we should all strive for but that's not where you're going to start you're not going to start with knowing how to do all the mechanics and knowing all the medical to save somebody's life or save your own life and all that stuff so no i i love everything what you're saying i just want to make sure that the people who are listening that are newer to the sport don't become overwhelmed you know it's, uh, it's i'm glad you brought that up because so we can kind of say yeah if you're going out to the middle of from fuck Idaho in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> like you probably should know some shit. Right. But to start with, uh, what we do at our shops uh, and dealers is we run little mini uh, bike packy things. Now, they're not even an overnighter to start with. Yeah. And so you're getting your bike out and you're getting kind of some legs and you're seeing what you like and you don't like, what position, you're kind of getting all that right. Because I think that's important too, yeah. eh? You don't want to be a newbie be in the wrong position, load your bike up with shit and get in the first 10K and fucking hate it and then saddle your shit, yeah. you know. So I think you've got a really good point there. You've got to start simple. You've got to just yeah. get out there with some like-minded people, get the ride in, and then slowly but surely, you know, like for me, most of my rides I can do with like one little chaff bag, a top tube bag, uh, some some jersey pockets, you know, and that's like a lot of my riding. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's just day stuff. You don't need much, um, yeah. Local day stuff. You know, I don't need to, to, to drive hundreds of miles to have a good time. You know what I mean? I try to have a good time every weekend. Every weekend, if if, if I don't have anything businessy planned, I'm on the bike. You know what I mean? And uh, if I can get an overnight in, great. But if I don't, don't have time, doesn't matter. It's like an hour here or an hour there. It's just about... Getting the legs. I think getting the legs is really important. I think one of the targets people should start with is to have a goal and repeat it. And so when I when I tell people, I say, yeah, start with start with 20 mile. Start with 20 mile and just repeat that until that feels nothing. Yeah. 
and then work with 50 mile until that feels nothing. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then you get to a point where you're doing, you're doing a a hundred mile and it doesn't feel like you've done anything and you're like, I want to do more, you know? And that's when you're, that's when you've got legs. It doesn't matter if you don't have legs because within 200 mile, you're going to have the legs you need anyway for whatever you're doing. So, I mean, you know, it's worth starting out small, trying to get legs on local rides, uh, but don't be an obsessed with it. Don't worry if you haven't got your legs yet because you'll find them out there, <laughs> I guarantee. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the way I look at it is we, what we touched on earlier. Number one, you as a human are way more capable than you think you are, period. I mean, we 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 don't realize our full potential and we don't live in a world that requires us to tap into it. Everything is easy. Everything is air conditioning and automated and everything, right? So like most people don't even know what they're capable of. I completely forgot what we were talking about. Yeah, well, what you're just basically saying is we're way more powerful than you do. And so these new people, when they get out, they're the newbies. I don't know if this is for newbies, but the newbies have got to realize that yeah, it's going to be hard, but it's all doable, and then it becomes easy. And it's only hard because you've never done it. That's you know? a, yeah, that, that's that's, that's right. Hard. But real quick, you go, oh, yeah, get the gist of it. Oh, boom! I'm I'm next thing. Next thing is hard, you know. And yeah. I work with the next thing. Um, yeah, it so, never stops. Yeah. It never stops. It's it's you know, you start at the very small, like we're talking about the small trip that's hard because shit goes wrong. And then you learn from that and then you build on that. And it's always a progression. You never stop, you know, you, you, and you touched, touched on the beginning of the show where we talked about, you know, there's always someone smarter and someone not as well informed as you are. Right. So you can either be learning from someone or teaching somebody regardless of, wherever you're at in your progression. My, my success, I say, is based on 5,000 failures. Yes. But my ability to fail is paramount in my success yeah. because the crazy thing is all the cool things I've done, done by accident. I'm not that smart. I can't figure this shit out. I just try so many times and fucked up and failed so many times that eventually I did the right thing, eh? Yeah. It's like, you know, Edison said you only got to do it right once. <laughs> but it's a, it's a doing it wrong hundreds and hundreds of times that gets you there. Yeah. And so it's all about failure because yeah. only in failure can you learn what you need to learn to get to that next stage, that next stage of confidence. And that confidence is really the treasure that's hidden out there. So you get out there, shit happens, you get through it, you get that confidence. You can't buy that confidence. And you you put that in your pocket, right? Can you imagine how confident some of these really good riders are, you know, like? You know, the fancy people of the world, they're super confident. They've learned their hard way, you know, but they've all learned the hard way. Yeah. And so we can say There's that no it's definitely going to be hard, but it's actually not going to be that hard. It's only, you only think it's hard. <laughs> <laughs> it only is, it, it, well, it's just a series of events, right? You don't go from starting to winning the tour divide. You, 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 you do all the things in between that get you there. And it, it it builds on each other to the point where, yeah, it it's never harder than it it was the week before or whatnot. You know, like you're just you're just progressing. We are so adaptable, and like it's interesting. They say it's the survival of the fittest. I think uh, there was misquoted there. I think I believe it's actually survival of the most adaptable. Um, and to be adaptable is what gets you through. You know, when shit goes wrong, you got to adapt. Um, when you crack, you got to adapt. Um, it's all about being adaptable and 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 being able to to have those uh, mindset. That mindset that doesn't matter what happens. Yeah, it's going to get tough. Like w- the old person in me says now that I'm not going to be able to turn up to a race or an event at 100. percent I'm just not. You know, I'm 
half broken from the years of fixing bike or I might feel sick that week or I might have had a, a bad run or a sickness in lead up. You know what I mean? You're never going to be 100%. Hey, you're going to go in stressed. Like people know that, yeah, it's going to be scary. It's okay. You're allowed to be scared. That's normal. That's a normal reaction. You can't knock yourself for feeling scared, yeah. but you need to know that it's a feeling. It's, it is a feeling. It might not. It's, there's nothing really scary out there most of the time, you know what I mean? It's just a feeling that you are scared that you need to then work through a mental thing. So that's what they say after about four or five days, that's when it's more of a mental thing. Your legs, you know, you're used to rolling along, you know, unless you've got any injuries, it's it's really a mental thing. So you've yeah. just got to start get out there with anything, you know, if that's just a basic bike and basic pair of shorts get out there and enjoy and um i think that's really the main thing um that it it should be fun regardless i mean we're talking about ultra endurance and bike packing but it doesn't matter if you like to commute to the store to go get a coffee or ride across america or whatever you want to do the important thing is that you're enjoying it and and uh we we can see the benefits of riding bikes. I mean, from a sustainable uh, way to to travel to um, just fun, just a, a better way to experience the world. You know, if you get on a bike, you're gonna find a way for it to be fun. I was listening to a rap song from Nas uh, back from like the 1980s the other day, and he was talking about riding his bike. You know, like um, back in the day, how. All he had to do was ride his bike and smile and have fun. You know, he didn't have to worry about anything. And I think that's still on some level what I'm searching for is that um, that kid that would ride around the neighborhood and and just have a good time, you know, and ride his bike and not worry about everything. It's well, freeing. It's, it's, it's hand in hand. Like in Australia, we're seeing reports here that for instance, they're treating sick people with exercise. Oh, and what ooh, they're showing is that, look, and they did it with cancer patients. So they got a whole bunch of people with cancer and some group, they only gave them chemo. And then some group, they gave them chemo and exercise and some group, they only gave them exercise. And the, the result showed that exercise was up, up to 50% as effective as chemotherapy. Whoa. And so it's the the cells dying and renewing, the the gut bacteria um, dying, um, the brain. Uh, they say the gut is a second brain. Yeah. Um, so the fact that our metabolism starts off and the exercise creates a whole bunch of biofeedback stuff that really does create a healthy mind. Yeah. Like I'm a little bit on the nuttier side, and if I don't ride my bike. Like it's, you know, I need to get out and, and, and get that exercise because that's what we're meant to be doing, chasing mammoths yes. with spears yeah. sort of thing. Like that's how we evolved. Yeah. Um, I think our sedentary lifestyle is, is possibly some of the reason why, you know, we've got such a high level of mental illness and depression in the world, you know. Yeah, people trying to figure it out. They don't know what to do. There. Yeah. They're antsy. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, we're talking about how we don't tap into the full potential of what we're capable of. And it's because we're not in an environment where we are required to. Um, going on these trips that we're talking about doing is a luxury. You know, we we, we choose to go out there and, and put ourselves in weird situations so that we can fulfill, I think, something that ties to our past that that makes sense to us you know we're restless we're looking for that tie into that person that we were probably uh evolved to be you know and uh yeah we just live in a weird world we never we don't have to we can just sit back and take easy street if we want to but if you're willing to go out there and ride your bike and continue to push yourself it is absolutely remarkable what you're capable of experiencing, the, the things that you're able to see, the people that you're able to meet, and, and the things that you learn about yourself, you know, as a, as a person, you know, like not 
where you fit into this world, but where you, where you can really like have a conversation with yourself when things get hard and say, okay, who am I right now? What am I going to do? You know, how am I going to react in this situation? And, and the, the crazy thing is, is like, we, we are hardwired to want to be tough and want to like, just keep pushing, but we just don't put ourselves in that position often enough. Well, it's really interesting. The Aboriginal people here in Australia, the local Aboriginals, yeah. they have a ceremony where the, the boy becomes a man. Yes. And, uh, the, sometimes it's combat. Sometimes it's, you know, can be quite um, scary and, and full on. Um, it, it seems in sort of our sort of Anglo-Saxon, English-based culture, that there was no real ritual for that, you know what I mean? And so I think what we kind of, as a young man, I certainly wanted to see how good I was and I had to climb the mountain and had to, you know, rise to the top of the hill and had to see if I could ride down that bit or whatever, you know, I had to do my big big rides i had to find myself you know i think really there's probably everyone needs to do that i think in some respect people need to find who they are they need to be able to be released from conforming to the society's ideals that is not necessarily true i mean there's no there's no person that's that super wholesome fucking person that's you know got the golden halo like to a certain degree that's what society perpetuates that we should be like we should want to buy the house and do all that sort of stuff yeah. but really if that's not your thing you're gonna be unhappy hey eh? like i i was unhappy turning up doing a nine to five job and making someone else rich i was unhappy with getting told to do something a certain way, you know what I mean? And that's just the way I'm wired. For, for me to be me, I love making stuff, eh? Like I'm super, super maker dude. I love creating and making stuff. At the moment, I'm making telescopes because what? it's making telescopes, designing and making my own telescopes. I've designed and made my own cameras. When I was 12, I designed a machine to illustrate how the Doppler effect worked. Uh, I love making stuff. When I make stuff, it's what I love doing. I love working with my hands. Uh, I'm re I was related to Henry Ford. Uh, it turns out I found out last last month, and he was a repairman too, and he loved inventing stuff and getting workarounds, and so that's why I loved fixing bikes because I was really good at it and I was inventing really cool stuff, and, you know, my wheels were legendary, and I loved working with my hands, you know. So uh, that's how I'm wired, and I've got to be free to be me. Yeah. You know what I mean? I don't wanna, if I, I'm going to get depressed, man, if I'm shoved in a box doing something I don't want to do. Yeah. So I think the ultimate art is to get out there, to get confronted, crack off that shell of conformity to ha that can only be done by gaining the confidence. You know what I mean? Yeah. Gaining that confidence of being out there, having that in your pocket, right? Well, I've done that. And then having that confidence to be you and not being so scared to have to conform to what they want you to do because yeah. it's only going to lead to unhappiness. You're just going to be like, this is fucked. I don't want to do this anymore. You've got to be yourself. And I think that's the ultimate goal. And it's a ritual to get out there and survive and go through those problems. I think that's, that's the uh, takeaway that we all talk about. Uh, whether it's you get that in religion, whether you get that through, you know, uh, sportsmen's uh, achievements or just getting out there and achieving your own goals. You know, I think we're all destined to do that. And if we don't do that, if we don't see what we're made of, we're going to be unhappy. So I'd just like to say to everyone out there, doesn't matter who you are, what you've got and how you do it, you got to get out there and find you out there and what you're made of somewhere, whether that's on foot, backpack, jogging, running, walking, on a bike. I think we have a lack of that and we need to get back and get out there and do shit. What do you think? Doing shit's the key. Dude, uh, we saw on this show a lot, ride your damn bike. Um, 
but I Probably. think it applies to more than just riding your bike. I wholeheartedly agree with you. We're becoming uh, too, ob- dude. On my bike ride this evening, right before uh, this interview, um, I was, you know, I was out there on my bike enjoying the evening, and I saw a quite a few people on jogs or walks, and they're just staring at their phones. Like you're you're out there recreating in nature and you you don't even look up you know we i know know. i know you you gotta you you gotta stop that we gotta get back to uh to being like humans and not so connected to this other identity that we've created on the internet that people are consuming and responding to which is easy to get sucked into. I mean, I'm I'm on social media. You are on social oh, media. Dude, dude, they spend millions of dollars, billions of dollars to get sucked into. Exactly. Like, seriously, it's designed to be addictive. You can't be ashamed for being addictive. You can't be ashamed for being addictive. You just got to call it out. Yeah. You just got to say, hey, whoa, this, this, they're spending lots of money making me want to keep looking at this shit. I have it too, hey. Like, I want to look at this thing. And I think, well, I'll just turn it off. Like, I'll go in airplane mode now. Like, yeah. I don't want to... I don't care, you know. I don't care. Yeah. Sometimes you just got to turn off, you know. I'm, I'm only a recent convert. Can imagine these people that have been with it all their lives and their brains hardwired from a young age to want to look at that shit. That's a problem. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, you oh, I, 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 I was say, born in 80. When were you born? 73. Yeah. So I got the internet in my house when I was 14. Oh my God, that is so perfect. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I like how you made that connection like immediately. <laughs> yeah. Funny life. Funny life. Oh, that's so funny. But yeah, I mean, like, I have an interesting perspective, and so do you, where we grew up riding our bikes. I mean, what are your parents? I mean, at least in my world, my parents kicked me out of the house, rode our bikes, made jumps, shitty jumps. We got hurt. And that was life, you know, and then that's and then the, the internet ground. came along. What? That's the learning ground. Yes, yeah. I mean, that is the learning ground. As a as a kid, that's what you should be doing. You should be out there teaching your body through. We talk about failures through failures. You're going to make mistakes, but every time you make a mistake as a kid, you learn something. You become more capable of avoiding that injury or that mistake. If if you're going off a shitty ramp that you built off a hill, like in my backyard when I was growing up, we had a hill going back and we'd make some crazy ramps going off of it. And if your weight was in the wrong place, you ate shit. But the next time you did it, you remembered that and you corrected for it. Well, get this right. If a baby, like a little baby, wah, wah, baby, wears little booties, right? They lose the ability of that sensory touch through their feet, right? They need that, right, to start wiring the connections in their brain because the brain's kind of like blank and they wire the connections through sensory feedback. Yeah. And that's how it works. So if the baby's got booties on, right, they're getting less sensory feedback, so there's less shit happening in their brain. So they say babies have need to have feet to feel the ground and got to do that, right? Yeah. And so if you're in there not moving around, on typing on the keyboard, playing the bloody keyboard warrior, fighting on the internet about stuff that you know nothing about, <laughs> well, you're not you're not doing it right. You got to get out there and 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 fall off a couple yeah. of times and scrape your knee. What and you, people out there should know that you should always wear gloves because your hands are going to come down first. That's my pet hate. You're not bike ride unless you're wearing gloves. Sorry. Sorry, folks. Wear gloves. Safety announcement. <laughs> I'm, I'm like 50-50 on gloves, so I'm just going to remain Switzerland on that. <laughs> <laughs> I um, haven't had a decent crash then. <laughs> I haven't. You know, you were talking earlier about how, like, I mean, the way I explain it to people is I started riding a bike when I was four, you know? I mean, I started walking when I was two. So I'm, I've am i been riding a bike almost as long as I've been walking. I'm pretty damn good at it. I don't fall when I walk and I don't fall when I ride my bike. I mean, I'm yeah. pretty adept on a bicycle, but that's because I've been doing lucky. it for you're a lucky. long... Huh? You're lucky. I, 
you're lucky because not everyone's blessed with balance. And so you just got to ride within you, within your, um, yeah. your own self, wear the safety equipment, because especially when you're out in the field, you know, if you can wear a helmet, that's great. If you're not into them, fair enough. Um, but I reckon, um, safety equipment, if you can wear it, if you, especially in your new, definitely wear those gloves, definitely keep that helmet on and, you know, um, wear eye protection, uh, that's that's really handy. Some of the silly things can can put you down, can't they? Yeah. Um, I got hit yeah, in the that, eye with a bug. I'm laughing because I, I've been doing a lot of night riding lately, uh, powered yeah. by my Dynamo and my K-Lite. Shout out. Um, I just by that all. Thanks for listening. Yes, thank you. Fine print. Um, but yeah, I got hit in the I got hit in the eye with a fucking bug. And I, I've been, I'm cheap. I'm so cheap. I, I will not spend money. I mean, you talk about like consumerism and uh, buying local and stuff. Like I try really hard not to just buy shit that I'm just going to throw away and be responsible and, and buy shit that will last a long time, you know? Anyway, so I've been riding for a while without eye protection and then I got fucking nailed. I mean, going 20 plus mile an hour with a, so I don't even know what it was, but my eye was bruised. I've never, my eyes never uh, hurt that uh, bad. But the point you is could like. Crash, you could have crashed right your fucking neck. I could. I No, no shit. When I'm in the bush, yeah. I watch every step. Every step. Dude, it's I'm from not, Texas. See, you've got to be really careful and not rush. You know what I mean? You've got to not be ahead of yourself. You've got to be where you are. Yeah. You can't be thinking about the fucking fancy hamburger, fucking the next town. It's got to be here. You've got to be in the moment. You've got to watch each step because it's that dumb ass shit that'll fuck you up. Yeah. You know, and your body's going to be fine. You're tubeless. You probably won't get a flat. You know what I mean? Everything's going to work great because you spent a whole lot of time looking at that and you were so busy thinking about how good your bike was, you tripped over a little fucking log or something and you twisted your ankle. Yep. Right, you didn't have gloves on, and you and you ripped up your hands. Yeah, you know. So um, uh, we say, don't let your last event affect this event. Like if you went really good in the last event, and you won or whatever, or or you know, don't let that affect you. And this one, this one could all turn poo real quick. And so you just got to be calm, watch each step, try and be in the moment, and not try and think ahead of yourself. And and. And that's super hard, eh? Not get affected by the excitement of a race. Like the first day, drill. Put your blinkers on. You know, I tell everyone this. Don't get too excited at the start. Go off, blow your legs out and have to crawl home. Oh, yeah. Chill. Really try hard to just go slow and find your rhythm and um, put your blinkers on and ride your own race. Don't worry about what Joe it's blocks up the road to do. Yeah, every yeah. single time it's got to be your own. Ride your own race, put your blinkers on. Don't worry about what anyone else is doing Yeah, because they can stuff up. You know, we've all seen people go off the front, you know what I mean, and then they go too hard. It's like it's classic. The yeah. classic newbie rookie, I'm going, I feel amazing. I feel amazing. I'm going to run off the front. <laughs> and it was just the adrenaline of the start. And as soon as that wears off, whoo, that's Uh-oh. when you have a crash. Yeah. That's, yeah. Yeah, you're right, man. It's funny. Like everybody probably, well, not everybody, but a lot of people just spend so much time obsessing over their gear, getting it so dialed in. And then the dumbest thing can take you down. It just takes you out of it it could be a sickness it could be a a stupid crash you know whatever it is like yeah that's a, that's a good point it's like you gotta you gotta be a, in that moment and paying attention to what you're doing I and mean, that's like good shit can happen even then shit can happen even well, then like yeah the pros sure the moment, right? and shit happens like sure. shit happens you know what I mean? Happens. It yeah. happens. But there's less chance to do dumb shit that you're going to really regret, eh? Like if you just chill out, be in the moment, you know, and like don't – when you when you make a plan, don't half-guess yourself halfway through. Like that's super important. Like not nah, stick to the plan, eh? No, nah, stick to the plan. Oh, but, oh you kind of like half-guess yourself because you're all scared, right? No. Nah. Stick to the plan. The plan was to do this, follow it through. Because then you'll realize, oh, yeah, you know, 
you just got to stick to the plan if unless it's you know super bad and you need to change because yeah. you got to know unless you know yourself unless you're a pro right and know what you like under pressure and even know when you get nagged out like when you you got to know when you get nagged out you got to oh shit I'm cracked I got I can't I can't make any important decisions when I'm cracked. So this is why they say, and you'll hear all the people say it, never make an important decision when you're tired, hungry, hungry. or broke. Yeah. You know? So if you're nagged out, you don't go make the most important decision of your life. Like you have a fight with a missus. Oh, fuck, I'm getting a divorce, fuck. You know what I mean? Like that's yeah. the classic. You know, I mean? or you have a little something happen. It's like, oh, I'm going to quit. Oh, you know, no, that's I mean? important. Yeah, you got to have that perspective. I mean, in life and in bikepacking, it's don't freak out. And most people say wait an hour. You know, yeah. if you if you wait, wait an, an hour, hour. Yeah. You know, it's it's a whole different ball game. It's an hour. You're alive for 90 plus years, hopefully. We're talking about an hour. So, wait an hour. If I get this shit, take longer than an hour for me to not get the shits. But I know like, hey, you got the shits. Right. So you just got to deal with yourself. And it's like it's another person. Like you kind of look above yourself and go, hey, look, you got this shit. You're acting like a knob. <laughs> it's chill, you know, wait the hour. You know, sometimes it might take longer. Sometimes you just have to keep going. You got the shit. But yeah, you got to really know it and, and call it in, your, in yourself. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, what time? What day and time is it where you are right now? I'm curious. So we're we're Thursday four seventeen p.m. and I've got to go for a pit pretty badly. Okay, it's one seventeen in the morning here. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, are you happy with with what we've done so far? Yeah, I'm very happy. I uh, yeah. I yeah. absolutely yeah. enjoy talking to you. Um, and we should probably do this again. I feel like I could just talk to you um, a lot. What, what I want you to do, right, and this is from my gift to you from a brand new perspective, is there's, okay, so there's always someone dumber and smarter, okay, than you, right? So you can rest assured that people are super interested in you and what you say, right? I can just tell you that now. So don't feel like uh, you've got to be something that you're not. So just be you, sure. but... Be the guru in what you know, right? So you'll be like, okay, I know about this, so I'm going to get with this guy and I'm going to be a little bit of a, a, a guru in this. We'll do it very targeted. So we'll go, okay, today, Kez, we're going to talk about USB cache batteries, right? We're going to go over all the ins and out and you're going to help me mansplain it <laughs> to the, the people, right? And we're going to start to decode some of this sort of high-tech information, some of this kind of um, secret knowledge that the pros have in this pocket, you know. Yeah. It's going to yeah. skyrocket because in Australia we call a pocket a skyrocket. Uh, so how our slang. So, yeah, if you've got that info in your skyrocket, your pocket, yeah. you're going to be a lot better. So I think it's about you and me looking at the people where – working with and targeting some information packs towards yeah. them on different aspects. Um, you know, you know, it might be something brief, it might be a 20 minute thing on the well, e-trex. And, what, and what do you think about, you know, this podcast we put it out there and say, okay, what did, what did we talk? What did we not talk about that you really want to know about? Yeah. So to, to write in whatever the, however they do the feedback thing and say, well, what do you want to hear? Yeah. You know, like been a bike mechanic for 30 years, man. Right. I have 5,000 plus wheels, did tens of thousands of repairs, worked for many pros, worked for the Olympic team, the Australian yeah. team, the New Zealand team. Um, man, I worked with Michael Rogers from the Tour de France. He was in my shop, right, as a 13-year-old kid, wow. right? I've worked with world champions. I've worked with 24-hour champions. Like the knowledge that I have that is working with the pros, that's what I've used in my lights. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I have them to think that they tell me shit. So I go, oh, what I know and then what the pros want and this is what the latest thing is and this is what we want to do and it's all about maximizing this power band because I do this or whatever. You know, that is the gold that is light to carry. And I think that is something that I want to give back. You know, I want to give yeah. back this 
information, this knowledge, this this passion, this understanding, you know. I can talk someone through how to adjust gears over the phone. Like I know it inside out, backwards, upside down, you know, five different ways. Right you know on. what I mean? And, and, and the mansplaining that we can do for the particular people that, you know, you have listening, yeah. I think will be very beneficial uh, for your subscribers. I, I agree 100%. I would love to do that. Um, this show is a hundred percent about putting that type of information out there. You know, I mean, educating people and giving them the tools that they need to get out and enjoy the great world that we live on, that we get to experience, you know, and not just be tuned in to the, your phone or your TV. Well, you know, then, then you are offering a service. Like it's more than, oh, yeah, it's nice to know about what this person thinks and whatever. Now you're actually offering a service. It's, you know, a commodity. It's information. That, you know, and it's understanding and experience that people need to hear. You know, I love hearing the stories from other people and other yeah. people's races and events and what happened. I love that shit. I don't know why, but I love that shit. You know, it's I love hearing about you know, this rider did that and this happened, you know, because I can learn. I'll learn from a seven-year-old. I don't give a shit. I'll yeah. learn from anyone. Everyone. You know what I mean? I'm not the Everyone. best guy in the world. But what I did realize is it doesn't matter how smart you are. You just got to stop feeling sorry for yourself and get on with it. doesn't matter what you've got. doesn't matter if you're lying in the gutter. It doesn't matter. You just got to fucking believe in yourself. And, like, it's so true when they say the only person holding you back is yourself. Like, the old me hold me back. I had to kill off the old me. I've killed off seven me's. Wow. Like, and no, seriously, I hit the wall and I don't know what I'm doing wrong. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. It's all fucking up. And someone said to me once, they said, sometimes the only thing you can do about it is change the way you feel. Hmm. So I just went click, click in my head and said, well, okay, well, I'm going to reassign the emotion to that. So to start with, with failure. Okay, so we're all, give an example, we're all taught that you can't fail and you're scared to fail and I don't want to try something in case I fail. Okay, I had to reassign the emotion of that because I was failing so often. And then I realised that failure is fantastic. Actually, yeah. it's what got me there because i got one less thing, you know, don't do it that way, don't do it this way, don't do it that way. Oh, this, you know. You've got to get it wrong to get it right. Yes. And so I had to reassign how I felt about failure. That's an yeah. example. And so you've got to reassign the way you feel about things sometimes simply because you can't do anything about them. I did K-Lite. The whole thing was zero fucking money, right? No fucking money at all. But I had to do the whole thing to get my – thing out you know what i wanted to do i wanted to be a great man hey eh? like i wanted to be a great man i wanted to make a difference in this world for the good that helps the world and yeah i didn't have money yeah no one like believed me about my inventions or whatever but i just keep giving away for fucking years and i don't give a shit i don't give a shit if i've only got a bag of rice as long as i can do my thing that i love doing what makes me happy whatever big or small that is, that's so important in life. Otherwise, you're going to be depressed, you're going to be sick, you're going to be hating on your life and your loved ones, and it's 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 not right. Yeah. So we've got to go out, find ourselves, however however that is, be true to ourselves, be real, and um, bikes or death, man, ride or die. <laughs> ride or uh, die, bikes or death, ride your damn bike, rock, right? Rock on. No, this has been fantastic. Thanks so much. Man, uh, thank really you. Great. You know, you and I have way more in common than I think you realize. I mean, you've referenced being uh, homeless, and um, I, I've been in similar positions. I've been in and out of jail many, many times, and I've I had to reevaluate who I am as a human. Um, and it's actually been a good thing, you know, I think, because I have that perspective of – it's the treasure hard to obtain. That experience yeah. is treasure yeah. that enriches your life. It does because it, 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 it lets you know what a real low is. It lets you know what the bottom feels like and how empty it is. 
And, and like I have empathy for every one of those homeless people there, you know, and if I can give them some money or help them out or uh, give them some food or in any way or just even a smile and, and recognition, you know, it's like I guess I'm a big, big softy for that sort of stuff, you know. Yeah. If I ever had, if I ever got money in the future, man, I'd be setting up food places and, you know, in Australia I've got this van that goes around and washes clothes for people oh, cool. uh, on the street. And they've got all these cool initiatives and stuff. And, like, you know, I'd love to go to the third world countries and teach them how to make power from junk because I'm like, that's super fun for me. Like, yeah. I can pull apart a washing machine and rewire it into a wind generator. Um, you know, I, I've bottled dynamo hubs. I've got, like, a whole crate, milk crate full of bottled dynamo hubs because I'm going to turn them into wind generators and show people how to make really basic circuits to do uh, the, uh, USB charging in third world countries from recycled parts. Um, so that's kind of one of my passions, you know, to give awesome. back this amazing uh, invention and this amazing ability to adapt uh, with anything yeah. uh, that I kind of have, have. Anyway, that's what I want to give back. Dude, so thank you so much. I really no, appreciate it. You know what? Thank you. Have this boring bits. Um, <laughs> keep yeah. the good bits. I'll, I'll, I'll keep the good bits. But, you know, thank you for being you. Thank you for being real. The, the world is craving authenticity in a world of uh, social media and, and fake and everybody's got to Photoshop this or try to come up with a marketing plan to sell you on something. Uh I and I think a lot of my listeners are craving authenticity. So thank you for being authentic. Thank you for being you. Um, all those experiences, all, all those failures have led you to this moment that allows you to talk about from a real way what is valuable in life. You know, you, you've been able to experience the spectrum of life and and you can speak about that and i appreciate you sharing it and this will not be the last time that we talk i guarantee it there's a lot more to talk about i feel like uh, i'm stoked i'm super stoked like I, I i never want to say how good my stuff is and i think it's sometimes to my detriment like seriously i make the brightest dynamo light in the whole world and you don't need batteries anymore like the average Joe, you don't need batteries, man. <laughs> you can live on your bike with a simple dynamo like, and have lots of light and lots of powerful recharge, man. Like it is seriously, it's the best shit in the world. And like I'm, it does, I can't say that because it sounds like I'm just pumping my own thing. But like. No. It's, it I'll sounds like you believe it. There that, that you can, uh, you can look for three months. Six months. Do your research six months. Buy every light out there. Like, I invite you to. And, like, I don't care what you've got. You're going to ride next to a K-Lot one day and you're going to go, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> like, well, seriously, every, everyone that rides next to a K-Lot is just going to go, mm, I should have bought a K-Lot. Every oh, well. single time somebody, a cyclist rides towards me, they say it looks like a car is approaching them. That's what I want. I want I want a car to see me. I don't give a shit about the raccoon. I mean, I want to be able to see the raccoon, but I'm just saying, like, I want that car. That's the big thing. I want that car to know that I am there, and that light lets me see everything I need to see and lets everybody else know that I'm there. Hey. And it gives you the power that's only sustainable for a couple of hours with a battery. You know, you can sustain that all night. I got to ask you, this This is the one question I actually kind of forgot about that I wanted to talk to you about. Yeah. So you're in Australia. I'm in Texas. Both of them are hot as hell. I've adapted to do a lot of my riding at night, especially in like the summer when it's super hot. And doing that, I think, is really important. I think it's something that I haven't done a lot of, and I think people should because it's a whole different way to experience uh, the world and riding a bike. It's interesting. Like when you ride during the day, you're kind of seeing the middle. You don't see the sky as much and you don't see what's right in front of you. You're seeing like 
the middle. You're seeing the landscape. Yeah. yeah. But when you when you ride at night, your world is shrunk. It becomes the light that you have that you're generating while you're riding. Well, you're forced to be there, aren't you? You're forced right. to. You're forced. Yeah, you only have it's two. Actually, it's actually a number one secret weapon for many, many adv- adventure races and professionals in Europe. They ride through the night um, to, ca- to stay warm, right, because you need less gear. Right, right, yeah. They have a sleep in the day, right, and, yeah. and when they get their food in the hot part of the day, right, so a lot of their mileage is done at night with dynamo because it's heaps cooler. You can you can get more, I guess, kilometres under your belt for time uh, by riding at night through the night. And that's why that k a secret weapon. You know what I mean? The ability to ride through the night with huge amount of power and be able to see everything. Um, it's a secret weapon, man. Like, I'm serious. You've said it too. Like, it's a totally different world. Yeah. Uh, you save on water. You, you save on gear, especially if it's a bit cooler because you're staying warm. You don't need as much gear because you're not trying to camp out. Like, obviously, you've got to carry gear if you're snow line and there's different rules for everything. But in general, uh, you can get away with pretty minimal gear if you're doing a lot of night riding uh, and, and, and chasing that sort of warmth zone and avoiding that heat. I think yeah. that's one of the critical ways to get through the desert and probably yeah. what you're doing in Texas. You'd be sucking all your water bottles down in two hours if you're out there Dude, in the day. It's all Especially about the night tour. riding. Yeah, you can't. Yeah. So that's when you want to be having your siesta. Yeah. Well, thank you for day. you. Thanks to you for creating a great product. This is not a paid advertisement. I bought your light two years ago. I put thousands of miles on it i never worry about it it always works and it works well and i love it and so yeah thank yeah you. it's super cool man it's got no cpus it's got 1960s technology in it so Ooh. there's nothing that can go wrong man like there's it. no chip that's going to wig out and go error 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 super caps rock ride or die bro Ooh. <laughs> All right, bro. All right, rock and roll, brother. Take care. Hello, friends. Thank you for sticking around to the after party. I still haven't figured out what I'm going to call this segment at the end, but, you know, I don't want to after show. I don't know. I got to come up with a good idea, but for now, I'm just going to call it the after party. Uh, this is the part of the show where I kind of do whatever I want to do. If you feel like listening to me ramble on for a little bit and telling you about how you can support the show, then this is for you. If not, peace out. You can uh, you can go back and listen to one of the past episodes of Bikes or Death. And if you've listened to them all, then it's time to start re-listening to them. Okay? Uh as always, there is a lot going on in, in the Bikes or Death world. Um, I think I mentioned last time that I've, I've put together a group of uh, listeners who's, who have come to me, um, and, and we've created a, an advisory board, basically. It sounds super official, but, you know, I... I'm, it's mainly a way to just get a little bit of help with the podcast or a lot of help. I got to be honest, man. Um, everyone has been really blowing me away and really pitching in. Uh, oh man, it's, it's really cool because it's progressing way faster than it could be if I was doing it alone. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, the, the people who are doing it, they're doing it cause they want to be, they believe in bikes or death. They believe in the message and, um, hopefully they're enjoying it and having fun. I, I want it to be, uh, I want the whole experience to be fun and enjoyable. And if it's not, then why are we doing it? Right. So, um, there, there's no reason to make something that is a burden, um, to myself or to anyone else who's involved. This should be fun. So, um, the reason I bring that up is because tonight in what time is it in like three hours, uh, we are going to have our first meeting. Um, and we're talking about a lot of groovy things. Uh, we, you know, everything from like merchandise to branding to, website improvements, um, all kinds of fun stuff. And I won't bore you with all the details, but just wanted to tease it a little bit and let y'all know that um, I've got a great team that is helping me and expect big things. You know, it's, uh, I don't know where exactly it's gonna go, but I know that I'm excited and the people that are helping me are excited and I feel like that can only lead to a good place. Speaking of excited, I have a big announcement to make. 
Um, just this past week, Neil and Lindsay with the bike packing summit reached out to me and offered me a, I think it was a media pass or a press pass, something like that to the bike packing summit. I'm sure most people know about the Bikepacking Summit, but just in case you haven't uh, you haven't heard of it before, it's from their website. It's three days of riding, storytelling, and community building. Community building, and that's going to be October four through six this year um, at Mulberry Gap Mountain Bike Giveaway in Elijah, Georgia. Uh, and their website is bikepackingsummit.com. So if you're not real familiar with uh, with them and what they have going on, go check it out. Um, but they reached out to me, extended me uh, an opportunity to go and kind of cover the event. Um, we're still like working through the details. We have our first like conference call coming up in about a week or so. And uh, we're gonna talk about exactly what role I'm gonna, what role I'll play and how I can help and all that kind of fun stuff. But um, I actually reached out to them. Um, I really wanted to be there. I was, uh, I, I mean, for a lot of reasons. They're, it's a great event. Um, the presenters that they have are second to none. Um, and it's just a great way to get more entrenched with the bikepacking community and, and see where the trends are and, and hang out with cool, like-minded people and all those groovy things. So I'm, I'm very grateful that they, uh, they responded and were willing to have me out. Um, I am truly looking forward to it. And one thing that I'm looking forward to is seeing y'all there. So if you want to, uh, want to hang out, uh, go over there and register and let's hang out. Um, I still don't know what the format is going to be, like I said, but I'm definitely going to do some kind of meet and greet or hopefully a bike ride would be better, right? Bike rides and beers. That's that's what I'm going for. Uh, so anyway, I'm gonna I'm gonna be bringing uh, more information about that. But uh, if you're into that, please go check it out. Go to their website, bikepackingsummit.com. You can find them on Instagram and everywhere else. Um, but yeah, go take a look at that. And I would genuinely love to see everybody there. I know that's not possible, but if you can make it, please do. I think it'd be really groovy to get together with a bunch of other bikes or death people and actually see some of y'all in the flesh and blood. Um, it's, it's interesting. You know, I talk into a microphone, I'm sitting in my bedroom right now, looking at a wall, talking into a microphone. And I know that there's thousands of you out there who are listening from all around the world. And that is crazy. Um, but I really would love to put some faces with, well, I don't even have names. I have some names <laughs> from, but you get the point. I, I, it would be really neat to connect with some of y'all, um, to thank you in person, um, and to shake your hand or give you a hug or whatever it may be. And, and to go ride bikes together, uh, that would be freaking awesome. So like I said, head over there, check it out and sign up if you can. I'd love to see y'all there and we'll make it happen. Okay. What else do we have going on? Well, if you've been following social media, you already know, but uh, we had a vote for what would be our first apparel launch. And first we did a vote between like hats and shirts, shirts won. So then I did a vote with, uh, we, we had three different shirt options, basically the OG logo, the skull logo, and then the new design that's like a mountain scape. Um, it's really neat actually, if you look at it in detail, um, there's like a graveyard at the bottom and then there's one singular line that goes through it's like a trail that goes up and forms the mountains and so you got the bikes that are riding away from the graveyard up into the mountains and she even you know put my hammock in there which which appealed to me because i'm a hammock camper love it um anyway really neat design so we uh we put all three of those out there and said okay you pick which one do y'all want and they picked the, the number one, the winner was the Mountainscape, that last one I was just talking about. So um, I think it's a great design that really represents the Bikes for Death brand so well. Um, and that, you know, just black and white, riding from a graveyard up into the mountains. I mean, the whole thing makes sense. I freaking love it. Um, so we are, we are going to be 
rolling that out very soon. I was in, on the phone with a company today uh, about ordering some shirts. Uh, I got to give out a shout out to my boy, Sean, who's been helping me out with that. Um, he's really been instrumental in, you know, helping me put the designs together on the shirts and uh, running the Instagram polls and um, shit, finding the company, what shirt should we put it on, all that kind of stuff. He really, uh, he really took, took the bull by the horns and made it happen. So thanks to him for, for doing that. And because of him, we are going to get those shirts out ASA freaking P. So anyway, get excited, start saving your lunch money, um, get in your couches, find some loose change, whatever you got to do. Uh, these are not going to be cheap shirts. I can tell you these are eco-friendly, environmentally sustainable, organic, um, they're made in America. I mean, it's, you know, we really wanted to, I didn't want to have a cheap shirt, you know, and sell them for like 15, 20 bucks. I don't know. I, w I wanted it to be a real shirt that you're going to love. It feels good, fits good. You want to wear it all the time. It looks cool, all that stuff. So, um, I don't, we don't know how much they're going to be yet. We're actually going to be talking about that this evening on our meeting. Uh, but I just wanted to tease and let you know that they are coming. I appreciate everybody who's, uh, showed some enthusiasm. I can tell a lot of people are really stoked on getting some merchandise and, uh, I'm stoked for y'all to wear it. I want one, man. I can't wait to wear one, <laughs> wear it all the time. All right. I think that's it, man. Uh, if you've listened this long, then you are probably getting something out of this podcast, and I thank you. Um, if you would like to support the show, the best resource is bikesordeath.com. I'm trying to make it a one-stop shop, and it's so it's easy to follow, easy to find all the information you need. Um, and I got to give a shout out to my girl Alyssa with that. She has been really uh, digging in and doing a lot of stuff behind the scenes on the website that you can't see. And then she's also tweaking the, the visual aspect of it and making it more appealing. We're going to start uh, upgrading the show notes and all that fun stuff. But uh, <clears throat> the point is, is that I'm really trying to make bikesordeath.com the main hub. Um, so on there, you'll find uh, links to the show. You'll find my Amazon affiliate link. That's a great way to support the show. All you have to do is click it bookmark it on your desktop and then use it every time you shop i get a little bit of a cut and it takes a little bit away from just jeff bezos i think we can all agree i mean that dude didn't even pay taxes fuck that right give some of that money to me i will pay taxes because that's the way the world works um i'm not bitching I'll, 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 I'll happily pay taxes on that money i'll pay taxes for jeff you're welcome jeff i'm gonna get in trouble for this am i he's gonna fucking listen and all right, we'll worry about that later. Um, anyway, that is a great way to support the show. Uh, another one is Patreon. Uh, if you want to just kick a dollar or a couple dollars my way every single month, that's a great way to do it. It just, I mean, right now we're up to, God, a little over $300 a month, uh, which sounds like, a, I mean, that's a decent chunk of money. I can see people like walking over, you know, typing it in. They're like, oh, he's doing pretty well. But, um, Man, the truth is I really do spend a lot of time producing the show. It takes a lot of time to edit, to get the, you know, to do the interviews, to travel, to all the things that I do to produce it. I don't want to bore you with the details, but, um, but that money, it's a motivator. It really is like, I'm like, okay, people are paying for this content, right? Something switches in your mind whenever you know that people are, taking their hard-earned money and out of the goodness of their heart because they believe in it, they enjoy the show or whatever it is, they decide to kick some money my way every single month. Um, yeah, it just makes, it just lights a fire. I'm like, I'm doing it for those people. I'm doing it for the people who uh, really support the show. Uh, Y'all are the ones that get me fired up to go out there and track down amazing guests and stay up till 1.30 in the morning and recording a podcast and, you know, missing out on sleep and missing out on family time and all the other things that are like, <sighs> I'm not bitching. I'm not. I am so happy to be in this position. All I'm trying to do is say thank you to the people who support the show. And if you're not, but want to find a way, there's a lot of great ways. Um, Another one is through merchandise sales. Like I was just talking about right now, it's only stickers and patches, but we have got so much more coming. So 
keep hitting the uh, keep he- headed over to the website. Check out the store there. A lot of cool things uh, for you, and there's going to be a lot more soon. All right, I think that's it. Um, this week I'm going to switch it up a little bit. I've been creating some a loose list of rules for bikes or death members. And one of my favorite ones is ride through all sprinklers. You know, I just, uh, whenever you were a kid, what did you do if you saw a sprinkler? It didn't matter if you had to ride through someone's yard or what you rode through that sprinkler. Uh, it's summer right now. It's hot. When you're on your rides, you see a sprinkler ride through it. I promise it'll put a smile on your face. Uh, it'll remind you what it was like to be a kid. Um, and, uh, and you'll hopefully remind you that riding bikes is fun, you know, so let's not take it too seriously. All right, people, you know what to do. Go ride your damn bikes.